agenda uh, in front of us today. Um, for some introductions, I'm, I'm joined by an, an all-star team up here this morning. Um, for the commission staff, we have Max Appleman, um, Dr. Kristen Anshead, and Dr. Katie Drew. We also have, and Sarah Murray. We also have our um, Dr. Amy Schuler is the chair of the Menhaden Stock Assessment Subcommittee, Dr. Matt Sieri, the chair of the ERP Work Group, and Dr. Mike Jones, the chair of the Peer Review Panel. Um, we'll look first to um, our agenda for approval. Um, are there any changes to be made to the agenda this morning? Seeing none, we'll consider that approved. Up next are our proceedings from the October 2019 meeting. Are there any modifications to be made to the proceedings? Seeing none, we'll consider those approved as well and move on to public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public to comment on items that are not on the agenda today. Not seeing any hands in the audience, we will move on to item four. Um, the 2019 Single Species and Ecological Reference Point Benchmark Stock Assessment and Peer Review um, Reports. Um, there's one and a half hours for the presentations today. Um, each of the presenters, there are three, uh, have been asked to try to stick to 20 minutes for their presentation, allowing for an additional 10 minutes of, of Q&A. Um, after that, this is an action item. So at the end of the presentations, we will be looking for the board to consider a motion to um, accept the 2019 assessments for management use. Um, before launching into Dr. Schuler's presentation, I would like to take a minute to provide um, the board's deep appreciation to the many individuals that helped bring us to this point today where we are potentially on the precipice of advancing the way we manage this important forage species. In doing so, they've steered through waters previously uncharted by the ASMFC, and it's required a tremendous amount of, of work um, as documented by the 1,251 pages of the two combined stock assessments. Um, so we, we, we thank you for that, and I'll now pass it over to Dr. Schuler to begin with the uh, single species stock assessment. Good morning, everybody. All right, I'm going to walk through the single species assessment, trying to keep this brief. Um, so it'll be a rather quick whirlwind through the uh, single species assessment this morning. So I'm going to talk about the data that were used in the assessment, uh, the major changes from the last assessment, uh, the basics of the assessment itself, and then talk about stock status and future directions. So just a basic run through of the data that were used for the assessment for life history information. Uh, for maturity, we used the historical maturity data from the fishery dependent database which was what was used for the last stock assessment. For natural mortality we used an age varying yet time constant value. Uh, this was a change for this assessment in that we scaled this estimate to some new values from some tagging data that were reanalyzed. Growth was estimated from the fishery dependent data. This is the same as what was done for the last assessment. And then fecundity information was updated based on some work that has come out of Rob Latour's lab where they um, did some histological work to actually look at the fecundity of Atlantic Menhaden. Also included in the data were the landings and age compositions for the reduction and bait fisheries. So on this figure is reduction landings and thousands of metric tons in the gray bars. And the black line is the bait landings in thousands of metric tons. And they each have their own respective axis. Forty-nine fishery independent surveys were uh, considered for this assessment from up and down the coast. Uh, these surveys were not uh, specifically designed to sample Menhaden, but were useful for Menhaden, and I put in here potentially for other assessments. In order for the surveys to meet the threshold to be used, they needed to meet specific criteria. Those are listed in the stock assessment document, but included things such as having a long enough time series, catching menhaden frequently, things like that. Uh, these data sets that then made it through the criteria were used to create standardized indices. 
Um, these indices accounted for differences in catchability due to factors such as time of year um, or environment, et cetera, et cetera. So a total of five indices were used in this stock assessment. Uh, the first on the top there in green is the Young of the Year or Recruitment Index. This is the recruitment index that we've used for several years in this assessment. Uh, the other one on that top graph is a MAR map and Ecomon. It's a broken time series, so it's in blue and orange. This is an ichthyoplankton survey, and this was matched with the spawning stock biomass, which is in fecundity for Atlantic Menhaden. And then there's three on the bottom. Those three on the bottom all had associated length composition information, uh, catch size information, and so these each represent a different segment of the population. The red one is the SAD, Southern Adult Index, and that one is age one index. The MAD, which is the middle one, that sort of grayish one, is a um, Mid-Atlantic, uh, Virginia, and Maryland index, and that mostly represented ages two and three. And then there is the Northern Adult Index in orange there, and that was a index that had logistic selectivity, so our oldest ages are represented there. Major changes from the last assessment. Um, two in particular, um, the first is the natural mortality is, um, I've already mentioned that it's time constant but age varying here, uh, which is exactly how it was set up for the last assessment. The big difference is that it was scaled to a value based on a reanalysis re of the historical tagging data. There are two papers out um, by Lil Gestrand at all that detail that work, um, basically looking at tagging data with over a million tags and 100,000 recaptures. Uh, so a huge tagging study to look at uh, movement rates, but also natural mortality. The second major change for the assessment it was for fecundity. And as I've mentioned, this is work that came out of Rob Latour's lab. And what they've determined based on histology is that Atlantic Menhaden are indeterminate batch, batch spawners spawning every few days and so they're creating eggs throughout the season and spawning throughout the season and so the fecundity estimates have increased uh, quite a bit based on this new work. I should mention that that's very similar or it is um, similar to Gulf Menhaden and another Menhaden species in Brazil that also demonstrate that indeterminate batch spawning. Um, other major changes for this assessment uh, from the last one, there were two new fishery independent indices of relative abundance. The Mid-Atlantic Adult Index or the MAD um, was included this time in addition to the NAD and the SAD. And then we also had the inclusion this time of the MARMAP Ecomon Ichthyoplankton Index with respect to fitting to fecundity. A couple other changes. These are modeling changes more uh, rather than data changes. So the first is a new likelihood component type was used for the multinomial data. Um, in particular, a Dirichlet multinomial was used, which allows for accounting for correlations in the composition data. Um, but is weighted um, internally in the model rather than externally. We also had comments at the last review about the way we're looking at uncertainty analyses, and so this time we did our MCB, our Monte Carlo bootstrap analysis, which you guys have seen a number of times. Um, we did, in addition to that, an MCMC, a Markov chain Monte Carlo analysis, and that was just to look at different types of uncertainty um, across the different analyses. And so it gives some indication of um, each of them accounts for a different type of uncertainty. And so you can say, if we're accounting for this type, this is what the envelope looks like. If we're accounting for this type, this is what it looks like. Um, and that's detailed in the report if you want further information. And then the last change I'm going to bring up is uh, how recruitment was forecasted in the projections. Uh, for this assessment, we used a nonlinear time series analysis method, and basically it's a state space method looking at where recruitment has been um, 
So in our year we're in now, where has recruitment been that's been similar in the past and where did it go in the future from there? And so predicting based on a state space manifold and this is um, put in there. It still has quite a bit of uncertainty, but it's a little bit less than using the median with some deviations, which is what we've used in the past. Uh, basics of the assessment base run. Um, I'm going to fly through this. So <laughs> data were split into northern and southern regions. This was done for the last assessment. This helps us account for migration, fishery dynamics, and the tagging data. It better accounts for the population dynamics of the species and for the fishery removals over time, meaning that um, the, the uh, fleets are broken into the north and the south and they have different age compositions and so they're harvesting different ages. Here's the time series of recruitment that comes out of the assessment. So this is recruitment in billions of fish over time. The um, of course, there is one big age class in 1958, which is one that we see all the time with this species, if you're familiar with it. And as we want run through this, um, there's been three age classes that are, are larger in 2010, 2015, and 2016, and then 2017 is, is lower. This is biomass, age one plus and thousands of metric tons over time. Started off, um, this assessment starts in 1955, so the beginning years of this had a higher biomass. We saw a decline, especially after that 1958 year class is moving through. And then since then, increasing in the more recent years, our values are similar to what was seen in the 50s in this assessment. This is abundance numbers in billions of fish over time. The individual colored bars represent individual ages. And so red here, which is the largest proportion of the numbers is age zeros, which we would expect. And then goes down from there um, through ages one through six plus. This model is a zero to six plus model. Um, I would say the thing that sticks out here again is that 1958 year class is that biggest bar and then I would say that um, years more recently like 2010, 2015, and 2016 are similar to levels that we saw in the 70s and 80s. Uh, that was my run through the base run real quick. Um, I'm going to talk about how uncertainty was characterized really quickly in the next couple slides. Uh, the stock assessment subcommittee did several sensitivity runs. These runs are not necessarily considered alternative states of nature, rather they're used to assess the impact of assumptions made on the model. Uh, some examples of these runs included runs where we changed what the fishery selectivity looked like. So the fishery selectivity for the base run is dome shaped and we ran sensitivity runs with a flat top or asymptotic selectivity. We looked at inclusion of indices and so uh, basically taking an index out one at a time to look at what the impact of that particular index is on the results of the assessment. In general, um, I'll just add on to this, we also did sensitivity analyses to look at natural mortality and fecundity, which were two of the major changes for this assessment. Um, in general, the stock status was robust to model assumptions, and what I mean by that was the stock status was the same as the base run. Um, in addition to the sensitivity runs, we also did the Monte Carlo bootstrapping. This accounted for uncertainty in the model assumptions. And specifically, I have such as here in natural mortality, but specifically we included uncertainty in natural mortality and uncertainty in fecundity. The end result there was the stock status was the same as the base run. An MCMC, the Markov Chain Monte Carlo, was also run, and this accounted for uncertainty in model parameter estimates, and again, the stock status was uh, the same as the base run here. Okay, stock status. Uh, currently, so in this assessment, we're using the benchmarks from the last benchmark assessment, and so the threshold is the maximum geometric mean fishing mortality 
during 1960 to 2012. It's a historical reference, reference point. And then the target is the median geometric mean F uh, during 1960 to 2012. Uh, these were intended as interim reference points and, and moving forward towards ecosystem reference points, um, which Matt will be talking about in just a little bit here. And I'm sure you will all be talking about today and into the future. <laughs> So this is a figure of the stock status related to the geometric mean fishing mortality rate, which is the black line here. The F threshold is the blue line, which is at 0 0.60, and that is that maximum geometric mean fishing mortality rate for 1960 to 2012. And then the orange line here is the F target, and that value is 0 0.22. That's that median geometric mean fishing mortality rate for ages two to four during that time period. And then I put F of 2017, that's the terminal year of this stock assessment on here, we're at 0 0.11. So we are below both the threshold and the target. This is the alternative fecundity-based reference point, and so these are the reference points associated with the F-based reference points. So the blue line is the fecundity threshold associated with the F threshold, and the orange line is the fecundity target associated with the F target. Those values are in um, eggs there, and the 2017 fecundity value is, is 2,601,550, and I think this is in billions of eggs or something, quadrillions. It, it, there's more zeros, we just didn't include them all. Um, but what I want you to note here is that in the uh, most recent years, we have been above the threshold and bouncing around the target, and, and in 2017, we are above the target. So the stock status is not overfished and overfishing not occurring. Uh, the reference points were based on those historical performance reference points for the fishery. And uh, the sensitivity analyses and the uncertainty analyses that were run in, in order to see if our assumptions impacted stock status were robust and showed the um, same stock status as that of the base run. Future directions. So um, the Stock Assessment Subcommittee is generally asked what they think the timing of the next assessment should be. And so um, what we've traditionally put in here is an update in three years and a benchmark in six years. We also made several research recommendations. And in the past, I've gone through these before. But in the interest of brevity, I've, I've shortened this here and basically um, going to say that there are several recommendations on data collection and assessment methodology in the document. Um, some of those include things like looking at the adequacy of the sampling for the bait fishery composition data, um, doing MSE work, management strategy evaluation work, or um, a fishery independent survey for Atlantic Menhaden, a coastwide adult one, um, which is, are similar recommendations that we've made in the past. And then I, I put in here, so future directions, I put dependent upon the board and ERPs. So we will um, wait to see what happens today and into the future. And with that, I have my questions slide. Thank you, Dr. Schuler. Are there, are there questions about the single uh, species assessment? Dr. Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to ask a little bit about the method you mentioned for forecasting recruitment, the nonlinear time series method. Talk a little bit about how exactly that was used, how that's a deviation from how we've forecasted or handled recruitment in the past and what some of the implications of that might be. Sure, so the way we've handled forecasting recruitment in the past is to use a median recruitment value from the time series and then to select deviations from that. And so the uncertainty bounds on that were quite large. Um, and if you've been here and seen projections, you know that those recruitment forecasts were, were broad. 
This go around, we use the nonlinear time series analysis. There's a paper, paper by Ethan Dial that is available if folks want to look at it. And it's basically saying, if I am in this state space for my recruitment, what has happened historically and where did that go? And so it's basically saying if I'm here, my expectation is to go here or my expectation is to go you know, either up or down or stay steady. And so it's giving a little bit more information on where we would actually expect recruitment to go. And we looked at how well it was forecasting recruitment by taking our recruitment time series and then um, predicting each year of the last 10 years and then comparing it to where we actually were. And there's a figure in the report um, to demonstrate how well it did at predicting. And there's no uncertainty around either of those lines in that figure, but I think if you take a look at it, you'll see that it, it does a fairly good job predicting. It does narrow the uncertainty bounds for the recruitment predictions a little bit, not a ton, but some. John Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the uh, presentation, Dr. Schuler. Um, we all received a email about the natural mortality used in this, and I noticed in the, uh, the, the summary it was mentioned that the natural mortality used in this assessment was much higher than used in the previous assessment. Could you just go over a little bit about why you use this and whether it did have any impact on the results? So the natural mortality rate this time around was based on a reanalysis of the historical tagging data. So there is a large historical tagging data set that was done in the late 60s where um, the Beaufort lab tagged over a million fish and then they recaptured those fish so it's a, a mark recovery model and it was done at a time where models such as the brownie mark recovery models weren't even available so talking um, uh, late 60s early 70s and so those models really didn't come on to the scene until the late 80s and so but nobody had picked those data back up and reanalyzed them with new techniques and so that was what was done and in addition to that uh, Emily looked at how well we were actually able to estimate natural mortality from the data because sometimes you model things and you think oh I can really estimate this but you're not doing such a great job and what she did was she looked at that and we were and she was able to estimate it so it was giving a good estimate um, it, the, the value is higher than what we've used in the past. It is for age, we've scaled it to age 1.5. It increases, I mean, basically it's a scalar, natural mortality is a scalar. So if you looked at recruitment levels for this assessment versus the last assessment, you would notice the recruitment is higher this time on average, and that's because of the natural mortality. And that's demonstrated in the sensitivity run that's in the uh, assessment report. And anybody can feel free to add into that if they would like. So I think, you know, the, the comments about natural mortality, it's certainly something that we took seriously and we've considered because it is a change and it has an impact on the assessment. I think the if you compare this to literature values or meta-analysis of other species, it looks very different. But it's actually, I think, it's based on empirical data, as Amy said, one of the largest and most comprehensive tagging studies ever conducted on the Atlantic coast. And um, this is one of the few species that we do have an empirical value of M for. So the Stock Assessment Subcommittee and the ERP workgroup felt that this empirical value of M was a better estimate than a meta-analysis of a whole range of different species, a literature search essentially. Um, for other species, it's better to use actual empirical data that we have on this species. And in addition, it's not that outrageously different from some of the answers you might expect, depending on how you pick and choose your life history or meta-analysis choice. Um, so I think that the Stock Assessment Subcommittee recognized that this is a big change and it is significantly different from some other species, but we felt this was the best available data for that. Mel Bell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just 
Following up on, on what both of y'all just said, would you say that you have a high degree of confidence in this natural mortality as maybe uh, previous natural mortalities? In other words, is your confidence on a scale of zero to five, you guys rate it pretty high? It's best available science, and it's a huge tagging study. It's one of the biggest, if not the biggest, in the world. And I guess much more confidence than in alternative methods of alternative options for picking M for this species. So, yeah. Lynn Fagley. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Just to um, follow on on uh, John Clark's question. So, with the high natural mortality, that would lend itself to a a recruitment driven stock and somewhere and I in, in the material in those 2000 pages I think it was in a peer review there was a commentary that because of the high natural mortality and this recruitment driven nature that it's going to make it a lot harder it, your projections are going to be a little more difficult and they encourage the use of um, empirical methods to supplement monitoring stock status so I wondered if you could um, speak to that a little bit and just understanding your confidence with the M rate, what's our confidence in um, the stock status that we're projecting and is it, it do you think it's worth uh, looking into empirical methods as well? Thank you. So, um, yes, you are correct. That is certainly one of the comments that the peer review panel made. And it's something we've seen with Menhaden even before this, is that this is a very fecund, a very prolific spawner. You have a ton of recruitment, but you also have a ton of natural mortality, which is what you would expect for a forage species. And so your ability to project out beyond, say, the couple of years that are, that, that year class makes up in the fishery. You're also operating on a very small number of year classes within that fishery, makes long-term projections um, more complex. And so if you're trying to evaluate status, it really does benefit the species to do frequent assessments and you know, to, to frequent assessment updates to try and monitor the situation and make sure that um, you're not basing management on 10 or 15 years worth of projections. Thank you, Dr. Drew. Um, Roy Miller, I believe I saw your hand. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I wondered if I could just follow up a little bit on the previous discussion. Um, many or most of us received this email late last week without a lot of time to react to it from uh, Dr. Gerald Alt at University of Miami. I assume that everyone up front also received the email is there anything in that email that should concern us? Because if, if we took it at face value, then he said we overestimated natural mortality and in turn underestimated fishing mortality by subtraction. So I just wondered if we can put that to rest or if it's still a concern. Thank you. Staff is um, suggesting that we defer that question to um, part of the peer review panel's response. So we'll, we'll take that up again, Roy. Are there are additional questions about the single species assessment. Okay, thank you, Dr. Schuler. Um, we'll move on to Dr. Sieri and the overview of the ecological reference point assessment. Uh, my name is Matt Seri. I'm with the Maine Department of Marine Resources, and I'm also uh, the chair for the Ecological uh, Reference Points Working Group. Um, sorry, I can't see the slide behind me without like craning my neck, so if I'm off a slide, just let me know. 
So I'm just gonna give you a sort of an outline of where we're going today. Um, uh, we're gonna talk first about some introductory material. We're gonna get into some of the model outputs and inputs. Um, we're gonna do some comparisons among the models that we examined. Um, and then we're gonna look in depth at this uh, NWAX mice tool, including some example ecological reference points. Um, we're gonna give you some management advice. We're gonna wrap it up with a summary and then some questions just to give you guys a sort of uh, preview of where we're heading today. Before we start off, I really want um, to highlight the number of people that have worked on this project over the last few years. Um, chances are, if you're a state director and you have a staff person you haven't seen for a while, he's been locked in the ASMFC meeting room in Arlington for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, so it's, it's been a concerted effort by a lot of different people. So I'm not going to go through every single one of the terms of references. You guys have seen them. Um, they're pretty lengthy. Um, I am going to sort of go through two in particular that sort of framed our modeling um, as we move forward. Um, the, the first was to develop models um, that take into account Menhaden's role as a forage fish. And the second was to develop some methods that account for Atlantic Men Menhaden's role as a forage species. To accomplish this, we use a suite of different models, ranging from fairly simplistic to probably overly complex um, in examining the questions that were before us. These included things such as a surplus production model uh, with a little bit of time bearing R, um, uh, a steel Henderson approach, which looked at you know, surplus production in light of a striped bass index, um, a multi-species statistical catch at age, uh, which was Jay McNeese, most of his like dissertation, to give you some context. Um, and two sort of ecopath ecosim models. Uh, the <coughs> NWAX models, um, including a mice model um, and a full model. And the full difference between the two, um, both the NWAX um, mice and the NWAX full, is that they have um, one has a reduced set of predators and prey in it. The full model is a 96 pool model that covers everything from cod to skate to lots of other things up and down the US East Coast. So we basically stripped down uh, the full model to look at a, at a more um, intermediary model that allowed us to, to do things more on a management time frame. So we're gonna talk about some model comparisons um, including, um, you know, how do we take a look at each one of these models? How do we compare them? How do we make decisions based around them? And the two criteria that we really looked at, the, probably the hardest, was model performance. How well do they line up in terms of biomass and exploitation? As well as how are they, how are they at, um, at basically giving you the answers that you want to your questions? You know, what's their utility for management? So next slide. Before we get into the, the scary details of all of this stuff, um, I'm going to go through and, and basically give you a spoiler alert. Um, the ERP working group recommends a combination of using um, this Ecopath Ecosim uh, NWAX model and the BAM um, model uh, to provide management advice moving forward on ERPs. Next slide. So we're gonna talk a little bit about model input and outputs. It's, um, the ERP working group identified a subset of ERP species uh, to incorporate in, the, in this model. So basically we looked at a number of different important prey and predators within the ecosystem, the ones that are probably the most relevant for the questions that you guys have at hand. Um, it's important to note that not all models used all species. For example, that Ecopath Ecosim model that I, that I was talking about earlier, that full one, had 96 pools. It had a whole bunch of different species that you guys probably aren't, aren't directly interested in when discussing menhaden. There are some models that don't use any of these uh, predator information simply because that's not the way they're structured. 
right? So that would be the surplus production with time-bearing R, for example. You know, so some so some um, data were used in some models and not in others because of structural reasons. But our ERP species um, that we were looking at for most of the modeling approaches include two prey items, menhaden and Atlantic herring. Predator species including bluefish, spiny dogfish, and striped bass, as well as weakfish. All of these species, fortunately enough, were benchmarked or update within 2017. So we had data that was readily available. It's nice how when things actually work out. Just in case you're unfamiliar with where some of these species are in terms of their stock status, Striped bass, as you know, uh, was high in um, like the early 2000s to mid 2000s and has since declined over time. Bluefish uh, saw um, a period where they were highly variable, uh, but at least uh, relatively high biomass uh, through the 2010s and has since declined. Spiny dogfish during the 2000s was at a low point has since rebuilt um, in the early 2010s, but is, has some hint of declining since. And weakfish has just pretty much been um, at a low stock size for the last few years. So in going through each of the comparisons of each of our models, The interesting thing to note is that um, we have along the um, along the y-axis we have age plus one biomass. Um, along the y-axis, uh, I'm sorry, along the x-axis we have years. Um, and in black with the uh, gray envelope is um, the single species model, the BAM model, and its estimate of plus one biomass. And we also uh, have a, a number of various modeling approaches that we used. And those include the EWE or the NWAX models, the full models, the stripped down version, the mice model, the multi-species uh, statistical catch at age model, the Vader model, um, as well as our two surplus production approaches. And the takeaway like message here is that, believe it or not, all of them are pretty much in line. They all give us roughly the same answers, usually within the same scale. There are some differences, but as you can see, some of those differences are fairly minor, especially considering the uncertainty envelope around the BAM single species approach. Likewise, for exploitation rate, most of the exploitation rates since the 1980s have roughly been in line. Um, there are some outliers earlier in the year, and, it, and it's a, we have to sort of remind everyone the surplus production models um, generally tend to use a different data set associated with them. Um, and most of the multi-species models don't even start until the 80s, or, or a good portion of them, simply because they don't have any um, um, predator species in them until we actually end up getting MRFs data. The other way we sort of compared models back and forth uh, was to look at the model performance. Um, and these include um, estimates of exploitation in biomass and ERP models. They're similar to each other, right? This isn't really, this isn't really surprising. Most of the models were using the same data sets among them. So it's good that they all give us roughly the same answer. And in fact, for some of the Ecopath EcoSim, some of the NWAX models, um, they actually use the output from the BAM single species um, as input. To their, to their approaches. Okay. We're just going to take a two minute pause or so. I think there's a, a disconnect between the presentation that Dr. Sieri is working off of and what's being presented on the screen. So we're just going to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay. So, uh, sorry, you have, this is too.
Intermission's all right, over. intermission's over. We're ready to proceed. We're all looking at the same thing now. So we'll go, turn it back to, to Matt. Thanks. This is what happens when you email a presentation at 9.30 at night to staff. <laughs> so if you guys remember back in 2015, um, we had an ecological management uh, objectives workshop in which you guys and stakeholders and other members of the public uh, came together to sort of give us some direction as to where you guys wanted to go with ecosystem-based fisheries management. Um, so one of the things that you came up with were some fundamental objectives, and these included things such as sustaining Menhaden to provide for fisheries, sustain Menhaden for providing for predators, provide stability to all types of the fisheries, um, and to minimize the risk of sustainability due to a changing environment or changing climate. Um, I will add in um, that one of the things I think is important that the group thought was important was that if we developed a tool to accomplish some of these things, that that tool would be updated in a time frame that you guys need for management. It's not really useful if it takes us five or six years to update a model and you want to start setting yearly quotas, for example, right? So when comparing our models against your management objectives, um, I know you guys probably can't see most of the stuff on this slide, um, but along the top, um, there are your fundamental objectives, right? Including sustain menhaden to provide for predators, sustain menhaden for providing for fisheries, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you'll notice that two of the models, the Vader model, the statistical catch and age approach, and the NWAX model, the EWE model, hits most of the boxes, right? Um, they hit most of the things that you guys want measured and address most of the concerns that you guys have at least according to the EMO uh, workshop. Um, you'll notice that none of the models do a really good job with environment, um, uh, uh, environmental change, and that's simply because they haven't been, that hasn't been incorporated yet. So for addressing management objectives, the VADER and the NWAX models uh, were the only models that really provided feedback uh, or were capable of providing feedback on where the predator populations were in response to Menhaden. Um, but only, only the EWE approaches, as currently formulated, allow you to look at the Menhaden population and its effect on the predator popula population, rather than just the removals by the predators on the prey. Right, so it, as a two-way street. So in providing management advice, um, this EWE approach allows us to explore the effects of menhaden harvest on the predator population. However, the single species model is just better in capturing the dynamics, particularly short term, of Atlantic menhaden. It has the ability to look at things such as selectivity, um, changes in fleet behavior, um, as well as recruitment pulses that you simply just don't get from an EWE or an NWAX approach. So because the full EWE model is such a bear, um, in fact, if you wanted it updated, we would have had to have started last week. Um, we decided to remove um, all but the most important predators and prey in the system to give a sort of streamlined or a stripped down version that, allowed, that would allow you to make management decisions in a timely way. Um, based on the, the comparisons between that, EW, that full EWE NWAX full model, striped bass were reasonably good proxy uh, as a sensitive group within that stripped down model. So given all that information, we're gonna recommend moving forward um, uh, with this EWE NWAX approach, as well as a single species approach, uh, as a combined tool for providing management advice to you guys as you move forward for ERPs. Well, let's take a look at what this tool really is and how it works, as well as some examples. Um, the first thing that to start off with is that there's no right answer uh, for targets and thresholds for Atlantic Menhaden and in a sort of ecological context. Where you want your Menhaden, where you want your Menhaden to be, 
will depend on where you want your predator population to be. Um, where do you want the predator population, predator, uh, I'm sorry, the predator population to be, as well as the fisheries that are associated with them. The NWAX mice model uh, can illustrate the trade-offs between Menhaden F and predator biomass and predator F. So let's get in the, the, what, we, what we lovingly call the rainbow plot um, that we've been using. I know you guys have probably had handouts to that effect uh, with this um, figure on it. What I want to sort of guide you through is that we have, we have striped bass F um, on the y-axis going up, menhaden F on the uh, x-axis moving along. Darker colors basically are more striped bass, the purples and the blues, moving to red which are less striped bass. That's a good way of thinking about it. For each um, Menhaden F and, um, and striped bass F, there's um, a, a point. And this point actually ends up coming into a line when you think about it. So you've got two lines on there. The one for biomass, um, at biomass threshold, basically this is your striped bass uh, threshold level as currently stated in its FMP and then you have its target um, so if you look at where you are with striped bass now right there um, what what you'll see is across that entire horizon uh, of Menhaden F um, that you're not anywhere near your B threat, well, you're a little bit close to your B threshold, but nowhere near your B target for striped bass, right? You'll also notice that there's no Menhaden F that will get you to your B target, even if you set Menhaden F to zero. Hopefully you guys are all with me. Hmm. Yeah. If you, can, if you continue to fish at F at 2017. Right? If you move striped bass F to its target level in this line, right, you'll see that you can actually achieve both your B target and your B threshold. Where you are between those um, is going to depend on where your Menhaden F is. This is where your Menhaden F currently is. And you can see that if you fish your Menhaden at the current rate with your striped bass at its F target, that you end up achieving your B target. This next line is uh, the F target for Atlantic Menhaden, the single species one that Amy was just talking about. Right? If you fish your striped bass at its F target, and you fish Menhaden at its F target, um, you end up between your B target and your B threshold for striped bass. This next line is the threshold um, for um, Atlantic Menhaden. So if you fish Atlantic Menhaden at its threshold level and you fish striped bass at its target level, you don't achieve your B threshold uh, for striped bass. So we, f we ended up using striped bass because we found that it was the most sensitive uh, fish predator um, to menhaden harvest. Um, the NWAX full model found that striped bass and birds were, were fairly sensitive. But the understanding for us is if we were going to go, go forward and move through and, and sort of develop example ERPs, um, that we would do so for striped bass as that would probably allow um, um, for birds to respond similarly to striped bass. Right? So we defined an ERP target and an ERP threshold with the ERP target as an example being the maximum F on Menhaden um, that can sustain striped bass at its target when striped bass are fished at its F target. And then to do a threshold, which would be the maximum F on Menhaden that keeps striped bass 
at their B threshold while striped bass are fished at their F target. And just sort of give you a picture of what that kind of looks like. This is similar to the graph that I had before, except what you'll find is that, that on the y-axis we have striped bass as a ratio of B to B target. So that one line is that when striped bass is at its B target. That, the dashed line that's below that, um, that uh, line is when striped bass are at its threshold. And as you can see, you can have different levels that would correspond to different menhaden fishing mortalities. In particular, um, if you look at the, the green solid line, that's where, uh, that's where, we're, um, where we're proposing as an ERP target for this example. Right? That's where striped bass end up hitting its, F to, uh, hitting its B target, and that is the corresponding F, tar uh, F for Atlantic menhaden. Likewise, you can go to the threshold, right? As you move down towards the threshold, um, that has a corresponding F associated with it for Atlantic Menhaden. We're suggesting that to be a, uh, a B thresh, I'm sorry, an F threshold ERP for this example. Interestingly enough, if you look at the, the gray, which I hope you can see, the gray line, that's where you currently are with your Menhaden F. If you look at the, at, the, um, at the other lines, the blue lines, those are your current single species targets for Atlantic Menhaden. And so what you can see is that um, your, your, typical, your typical ERPs for Atlantic Menhaden, in this case, uh, for this example, are more conservative than um, your single species reference points for Atlantic Menhaden. And just to show you kind of what that looks like. In this example, the F reference point, this is a sort of side-by-side -side comparison between our F reference points uh, for ERPs as well as for single species. For ERP, uh, that would, in this example, would give us an F target of 0.19 with a threshold of 0.57. Correspondingly, your single species um, reference points are 0 .31 and 0 0.86. So the example ERPs are more conservative. Your current F in 2017 is 0.16. And so not overfished and not, uh, not overfishing, I'm sorry, um, whether you're looking at either the single species or the ERP reference points as we've laid out. This sort of gives you just sort of a historical context of, of where Menhaden have been relative to these ERP examples. And what you can see is um, we've been usually far below the F, um, the F reference point, the F threshold, uh, since about the 1980s. Um, more recently, uh, we've been right around that ERP F target um, within the last probably you know, uh, since probably the late 1990s. We've been bouncing around that ERP F target. So for some overall management advice, um, this tool will, we think will allow the board and commission to evaluate the trade-offs between Atlantic Menhaden F and Predator biomass uh, in a quantitative and transparent way. Um, for next steps, we're gonna need some instructions from the board um, on other scenarios that you would like to run. You'll notice if, you, if I go back into some of my other slides, you'll see that we've done this sort of example ERP um, with all of the other predators and prey in the system being fished at current levels. Most of those are under FMPs, either by this group or by other groups, and therefore those are subject to change. And so we have some analysis that I'm sure Max will be showing in a bit that, that are suggested to run um, in order to, to look at what the behavior for the ecosystem might be if, for example, you also rebuild striped bass, uh, bluefish, for example. So just to sort of sum up where we've been, um, 
you guys tasked, uh, tasked us with developing uh, a tool that can help examine some of the trade-offs between menhaden removal and predator biomass. Um, we've developed a tool using both the BAM and the sing uh, as a single species model and an Ecopath EcoSim uh, NWAX model uh, to look at those kinds of trade-offs for you. We provided an example ERPs um, that you can use to at least formulate where you might want to go in the future um, and at least illustrate what kind of stuff you can get out of this tool that we've developed for you. Um, and for next steps, Max is going to talk a little bit about where we go from here or where you guys could potentially go from here, including some other analysis that we're going to suggest. Before we wrap up completely, I, I really do, um, I, I, I know you saw this slide earlier, I really would like to highlight um, current and past staff who worked long and hard on this project. Those people totally deserve a raise. Um, and, um, you know, they herded the cats, they got us, they got us ship shape for the meeting, and they worked really, really hard on the documents and in some cases the analysis. And with that, I'll take any questions. I bet there's no questions, right? Okay. <laughs> um, Allison Colden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, I just want to echo the statements of the chair and of you, Dr. Sieri, um, of gratitude to all of the hard work that the technical committee and the ERP work group have put into this. I think this is a tremendous body of work and, and stepping into a completely uncharted territory. I'm really impressed with what you all have been able to come up with in terms of presenting us with um, a, a model that is um, maybe not easy to understand on the first time around, but, um, but I think is a, a very thorough uh, evaluation of uh, what we were going for. I have two questions I hope will be pretty brief. Um, Matt, you mentioned that uh, in the full uh, model, the full EWE model, striped bass and birds were the most sensitive, and so striped bass was sort of chosen as a proxy for that. Was striped bass also the most sensitive out of the species that were included in the mice model, you know, out of the predators that were included? Yes. Okay. Yeah, striped, bass, striped bass far and away is the most sensitive uh, predator pool that we have in either of the approaches. Okay. And another quick question. Um, so the 2017 F values that were used for the focal species, has there been any assessment updates or other information to update those Fs since that terminal year for any of the species that were included? We haven't done so, but I'm sure those, if Katie can probably comment on striped bass and some of the others. Not for, not for striped bass. Striped bass is still, obviously we're working on management to bring that F down. Bluefish did do um, an uh, assessment update that had a terminal year of 2018. So we were able to use their preliminary data through 2017 for this assessment to get done on time. In 2018, they found that their F had come down below the target. Um, so, but the other species are unchanged since 2017. Okay, so the only one is bluefish. Yes, at the okay. moment. Thank you. Richie White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> so is the takeaway for a manager that understands very little of this whole process that we are <clears throat> the Manhattan population and fishing mortality uh, is exactly where we should be? Is that, is that a reasonable observation that I have a follow-up, if I may? Yeah, in this example, um, as I, as I suggested earlier, where you want to be is really a question for you of where you want to be. Um, and, and so as from the examples that we've given based around where, what striped bass reference points are, um, then your F is lower, is lower than that, right? Um, that said, changing any of your, um, changing any of your reference points for your other species, for example, would change what that answer is follow-up thank you <clears throat> um, I've noticed uh, with the uh, large volume of Manhattan in the Gulf of Maine <clears throat> um, being on the water I've noticed 
uh, a substantial change in predators <clears throat> um, coming in and feeding on the Manhattan in very shallow coastal waters, 15, 20 feet. Uh, very common to have humpback whales, <clears throat> minke whales, uh, great white sharks, uh, makos, <clears throat> as well as uh, striped bass. <clears throat> and I'm wondering whether uh, watching that happen, it seems like uh, the Manhattan staying in the same place for the all summer, not not seeming to move or you know staying uh, in proximity to shore in the shallow water, that that's easy access to the to the prey species. So it seems like the the prey species would be more successful in those circumstances than those pop those schools being spread out out in the deep water uh, where prey would have to go look for them just just curious as, as if that is anything that could could be looked at in the future the full ewe model that w that we examined um, did incorporate a lot of different types of predators and prey in, into that particular system into that modeling approach and so um, but for here we could, we're, we're just going to focus in on the prey species and predator species they're probably the most relevant for your management activities but but just to add on to that i think spatial and seasonal components are things that we would definitely like to work on in the future but obviously that's much more data intensive um, and the models aren't set up for that right now but as we develop this tool further that kind of um, information, spatial, seasonal information, would be very important, not just in the Gulf of Maine, but also in the Chesapeake Bay and other bays and estuaries along the coast. Bill Hyatt? You, you mentioned that um, striped bass and predatory birds were the most sensitive to your analysis, and then went forward with a focus on striped bass. I was wondering if you could just talk for a minute about what you did, what you know, about the interaction with predatory bird populations. And I'm asking this because I think many of us in the room are, are getting emails on this subject from a constituency that's not amongst those that typically communicate with us. There's a lot of interest outside the immediate fisheries arena. So just if you could talk about that for a minute and what level of uh, information you had and analysis that was done relative to birds, that would be helpful. Thank you. So that's a good question. And part of the reason, obviously, that birds are not, well, there's two main reasons. One is we don't have any management targets for birds um, in this arena. Uh, so it's hard for us to evaluate where birds should be. But more importantly, birds are a very data limited species compared to, say, striped bass. So in this model, we actually lump um, nearshore piscivorous birds into a group. So this inc includes things like osprey and cormorant as opposed to the larger seabird population like albatrosses that are further offshore. So this includes the ones that hang out nearshore and are feeding in those nearshore coastal waters. However, we don't have enough information to separate those, those out into to separate species. So they're sort of all lumped together. We don't have good information on the trends of these populations. We don't have a lot of good information on their diet data. So what proportion of these species diet is actually made up of menhaden? We've done the best that we can with the literature that's available, but it's definitely a source of uncertainty here. Um, when in the full model, their response over the range of scenarios that we looked at was very similar to striped bass, so that they sort of declined at a similar rate to striped bass as you increased menhaden fishing pressure. And so if we can prevent that kind of a decline in striped bass with a given level of fishing mortality, it's likely to have similar benefits to the bird population, the nearshore piscivorous birds as a whole. However, there is a lot of uncertainty around that, and that's definitely an area that we would want to do more research as well as more modeling work in the future. Lynn Fagley. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Dr. Sieri and the entire team. This is really um, brilliant, and I think you guys should really be proud of what you've accomplished. It's, it's very exciting. Um, it's difficult though, it's, uh, my brain is um, smoking, trying to wrap my head around it all. I, I just wanted to ask about your, the target. So the target, um, the suggested target, is the maximum F on Menhaden that sustains striped bass at their biomass target when they're fished at their F target. So I'm assuming that's 
an equilibrium prospect, right? So it's over time, that's what's gonna happen. But what is the impact? It does not mean there's a 100% guarantee that we'll meet the striped bass target, biomass target, right? So if we're fishing everything right where it needs to be, there's still uncertainty as to whether we can actually get to that striped bass target. So my question is, if that were to happen, if we really don't, if we're not getting to that striped bass target, what's the feedback to the ERP for Menhaden, if that makes any sense at all? In other words, if we're not quite achieving that striped bass target, how do we resolve that? How do we, does it affect the ERP or do we just keep going? That a lot of that depends on your level of risk, right? So, so you, each one of those points actually has an uncertainty envelope around it, you know? So, um, what you what you do if you don't quite achieve, the, you know, the the striped bass target to you? For example, you know, um, you're you're currently fishing at an F that's lower than your ERP target now, and your striped bass is nowhere near its target biomass, right? So where, where that, how that all figures out, how that all comes together is based around sort of your risk. Um, do, you keep men, do you keep fishing Menhaden you know, precautionarily um, when, you're, when your predators aren't near their, their targets? That's, a, that's sort of a management decision. Does that help? Emerson Hasbrook. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the entire team up there. Um, I don't have a specific question, but Matt, toward the end of your presentation, one of your slides included a table that listed um, target and threshold um, and the values under uh, ERP and single species. Uh, could you just put that back up for a couple of minutes? Thank you. Just to clarify on this table, which I think Matt mentioned, but just to remind everybody, is the single species in this is the full F, whereas the single species assessment is reporting that geometric mean over ages two, three, and four, which are the main ages in the fishery. So the numbers are a little different, but they mean the same thing in the, mo in the framework. It's just that we translated them to the full F scale because that's sort of what the EWE model was, was most directly comparing them to. So if you look at these numbers and they're different from what the single species says, yes, but that's because they're measuring slightly different things, but they're the same. The interpretation is the same here. Thanks for that clarification. Um, John Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the uh, great work on this, Matt. Uh, just could you elaborate a little bit more about striped bass being sensitive, the most sensitive species? Because, you know, just looking at the uh, landings of Menhaden, they were much higher in the 2000s when the striped bass stock had reached uh, pretty much a historical high population level. Um, and in terms of what striped bass eat, we were very concerned about whether the striped bass were having a role in the collapse of weak fish in Delaware Bay during the 2000s. And we did a lot of stomach content work. And as in other studies, we found, yeah, when bunker available, that is what they will uh, target. But when bunker are not available, they'll eat what's there and you know we found condition factor didn't really vary much when they were eating sand eels uh, the only time I saw really a problem was when they were filled with lady crabs this one winter so if you could just go a little deeper into why striped bass would be so sensitive at this point when in the past as I say both pop the population of striped bass was much higher and bunkers seemed to be lower and yet you know they were both going in those directions in, in sort of the modeling approach that we took striped bass were the most sensitive out of the ones that we looked at I think if you were to compare this to some other ecosystems they would term that they would suggest that striped bass are not as sensitive as other for example other stocks um, in those systems um, so our, our striped bass tend to be the most sensitive of all of the predators that we've looked at um, but they're not, 
their their population status doesn't really depend that heavily on where Menhaden are, for example. Um, so sensitive in this case is a relative term with this e particular ecosystem. Go ahead, John. Um, if I could just follow up then, uh, would some of the other models like the Vader model, would that uh, take into account stomach content and the proportion of the diet that is attributable to uh, Menhaden for striped bass, and are you still looking at that model? We are, and in fact, um, that's one of the recommendations that was going to come out from the, the peer review panel, is that we continue to explore uh, the Vader and the statistical catch at age approaches as we move forward into the future. Steve Train. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have to simplify this stuff in my head. I, I don't come from the science background, so maybe you can help me, Matt, on this. Um, it looks like by doing single species management on Menhaden, we backed into a situation that's going to work fine in multi-species because the numbers are right there now. Um, and that's fortunate. It wasn't planned, but it's worked out. Um, so my question is, if the population of striped bass currently is what it is, if we had more menhaden in the water, would it help it grow, or do we need the population of striped bass to increase first? I'm using striped bass because you did. It could be any other species. Or does that population need to be higher before we have to adjust our numbers? Which one comes first? So I think the key to understand is that you have to adjust all of them at once. So right now, part of the reason, striped bass is, is experiencing overfishing. And as this, the heat map showed, that rainbow plot showed, if you don't adjust the striped bass fishing mortality, nothing you do to Menhaden will bring that population back. So I think we need to adjust both of them together. The board has took action that they deliberately chose not to fish at the single species target, and as a result set a quota that was lower than what you, the single species management suggested that we could achieve. And as a result, it seems that we've sort of, as you said, backed into a good, a good situation for these species. However, you know, so if we can maintain menhaden there, that's gonna benefit these predator species. But we also have to take action on these predator species in order to help them rebuild from a fishing perspective. Follow-up? Um, so essentially, if we say, all right, the, the Menhaden matters the most, we have to take care of this, take care of everything else. If we keep increasing it without managing the other one, we can't manage the other ones just by having Menhaden more populous. We've still got to step in and do something with them. This isn't going to solve all the problems. And that was the plot that I showed that there was no, like at your current F level for striped bass, there was no Menhaden F level that would rebuild striped bass back to its target. So you could set your Menhaden at zero fishing and your striped bass won't come back. Megan Ware. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll echo all of the congrats to you guys. I know this is a ton of work, um, so congratulations. Just uh, two questions. My first one's really quick for that handout we got. Are the Menhaden F units, those are in, ones in, are they different? So one's BAM units and one's the ERP units, is that correct? So yeah, we should look at these figures separately, not compare them. So the, right, the rainbow plot was done with the, that's the average F that corresponds to kind of the current status of the, the, the geometric mean average yep. from BAM, and then the curved plot that's not rainbow is the full F, the equivalent full F um, uh, from the BAM, but that's not the, as opposed to the average F. Okay. Um, my other question was, I was hoping someone could talk about kind of the relationship between herring and menhaden in the, the mice model. Reading through, it sounded like there was a prey switching toggle for a better term. Uh, but after that, I got a little confused. So I was hoping someone could explain that. Yeah, men, uh, again, herring are an alternate prey item, allowing, allowing the predators to switch from one, sort of switch from one to the other when one's vulnerable, depending on the stock sizes. Currently, just like, just like as we've talked about for Atlantic herring, Atlantic herring are actually at a fairly low stock size. So they don't contribute as much to the diets of some of the pre uh, predator species, as well as the fact that you know, they don't overlap a lot, for example, with weak fish. So they're an alternate prey item, depending on the relative ratios or the relative sizes of the population between Menhaden and Atlantic herring. Does that help? <coughs> 
Yeah, so I guess, so the herring biomass is included in the calculation for the example ERP. So uh, changes in herring biomass would also impact these numbers. Correct, and okay. as 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 we'll as we'll go through a little bit later, there there are some um, there are some alternative analysis that we can do based around whether or not men uh, whether or not herring are rebuilding or not rebuilding, okay. and you'll see those. And we do want to make sure we get to that. Um, so I have I have four more people, five on the list, and then I'd like to move to um, Dr. Jones's presentation, and there'll be more time to talk about this and continue to get a better understanding of this. Um, so let's uh, move to Adam Nowalski. Thank you very much. Very informative. Lots of good work here. Uh, so I might be jumping ahead. There's going to be a discussion tomorrow by the Commission on a larger scale about what the implications of this are for species of other management. However, I think that discussion tomorrow will be predicated on the decisions we make here today with regards to what we accept for management use. Uh, in looking at the other species plots that are included in the assessment report near where this striped bass menhaden rainbow plot is, there were two additional uh, rainbow plots there, one that incorporated bluefish biomass to B target and also one for weak fish B to B threshold. In both of those charts, if I interpret them correctly, regardless of what the Menhaden F values are, striped bass F values would have to approach 1.5 to get either of those other species to a B to B target ratio of 0.5 or a weak fish B to B threshold target of 0.5, neither of which I, I don't think, so, so what it's suggesting is we'd have to fish striped bass through the roof to help those other species from the information that's here, regardless of Menhaden. So I'm hoping you can give some advice on how to use the rest of this information as we do multi-species management. That, that information in there was assuming that you keep your predator Fs at the same level, right? Well, at the 2017 level. So at the so so you don't what it's suggesting is that you don't get much of a rebound in some of those other stocks if you keep overfishing them. Like for example, for bluefish, it doesn't matter. Uh, the we can give you that sort of context of what that looks like for menhaden and for striped bass, um, but those other predators are also subject to their own removal rates by their fisheries, and so that gives you the idea that. Um, that you need to manage for those species and not just striped bass and menhaden for weak fish, for example, right? So those were all done assuming that you had status quo 2017 fishing mortality. And, and to add on to that, I think the, the, there is those, we included those plots because they do contain important information, which is that the, at the extremes of these fishing mortalities, there is interaction in the predators alone. So the, the point of that plot is that even if you only change menhaden and striped bass, you're still influencing the bluefish or the weakfish population dynamics. And that, because there is an interplay between bluefish and striped bass, they're competitors and in fact, um, they also prey on each other's juveniles. So you're correct in saying that we need to evaluate evaluate how all of these interact together and to determine down the road what the best set of reference points for these are as a single species. I think, you know, we can definitely come back and show you some example plots for bluefish where you fish bluefish at their target so that they're no longer experiencing overfishing in these scenarios and see how striped bass F and menhaden F interfere, interact with that. Um, with those for the bluefish and weak fish, but definitely there's interactions beyond a single predator and a single prey in these models. This, this discussion will definitely continue under the next agenda item when we get there in staff's presentation that's going to be talking about, you know, the long-term plan and how the Menhaden board functions with the other species. Um, so let's move to uh, Allison Colden. Um, I'll pass. Uh, Connor McManus. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Matt, just on the biomass trends plot for the different models, um, it seemed that the, for the NWAX models, the interannual variability through time was smaller than the BAM. Um, is that attributed to the fact that the BAM captures more of the population dynamics of, Me of Menhaden, or is that, would you attribute that to the feedback mechanisms within the NWAX models? It's, it's how the models handle it, right? So for example, um, the EWE, the, the NWAX model is more of it, uses sort of stanzas for ages, so it will lump multiple ages together, and so you don't get that kind of spiky um, year class effect that you would normally see for something like the BAM, um, where, where it will show you good and bad year classes and changes in biomass accordingly. It's a little bit more spear, uh, smeared because it's a more of a biomass sort of approach. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Richie White. Pass. And uh, last, before we go to Dr. Jones's presentation, will be Malcolm Rhodes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, and this may not be the point or the time to bring it up, but uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you and your group for all the work you've done. It's fun to see this germinal idea that started six or eight years ago um, be brought to this point to be proofed and, and to be where we're at at this point. My only question to you now is kind of the housekeeping question. I understand that you're expectation going forward is we'll have two models to look going forward. Will your group, I, I know there's a lot of overlap um, between the two models, will it create a, a lot of extra burden on the subcommittee to provide those materials in a timely manner? And that may be something we're coming to as we move forward. So. Um, I'll take a stab at that. So obviously these models are very intensive and it's somewhat unclear uh, how much time would really go into updating these models, but in a nutshell, the ERP work group would take on most of, of the work. Um, when it comes to Menhaden specific tax setting processes, that would also be vetted through the TC, but sort of you still have that um, you can think of the ERP work group as sort of becoming the, the stock assessment subcommittee in this new realm um, and f everything passing through the TC for Menhaden specific tasks. Just sort of, just as a follow up, a reminder that we, we sort of built, we built this sort of streamlined EWE NWAX model with this question in mind to, to make something that's more updatable. So the species that are included um, do have information that we can, you know, pull off the shelf, so to speak, uh, to allow us to update it in a more timely manner. Um, but of course, it always will be a little bit more work than, than simply running one model. Thank you. And um, Dr. Jones, when you're ready, we'll pull up that presentation. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairperson Meserve. Thank you uh, to the Commission for uh, inviting me here to address this group today. It's a real pleasure for me. Some of you may recall that uh, I also chaired the uh, uh, peer review panel for CDAR 40 the last time there was a benchmark assessment and um, it's really extraordinarily interesting and, and rewarding for me to be back here having seen how much progress has been made um, in, on a variety of fronts um, with regards to the Atlantic Menhaden. I'm myself, I'm from the Midwest, I have really nothing to do with Menhaden, um, um, but I have worked on a whole lot of different fishery management issues including multi-species fishery management issues and this is a fascinating um, and uh, exciting problem to be uh, connected to. So uh, the um, next slide. The um, peer review process had to look at two assessment reports that you've just heard about this morning. There's a lot to read. 
Um, we held a workshop um, in Charleston in early November and our scientific review focused on evaluating the data, the models, the sensitivity analysis, and the overall quality of the assessments for both the single species assessment and the uh, ecological reference point assessments. Next slide. Um, the, the, science, the peer review panel had five members, myself as chair, Sarah Geiches, Daniel Howell, Ken Frank, and Lawrence Kell. Um, the last three being representatives of the Center for Independent Experts. We were very fortunate to have Dr. Sarah Geiches as part of the review team. May, many, you, many of you may know Dr. Geiches. She is, has, uh, from Woods Hole and has um, really solid expertise in food web modeling and multi-species analysis, so that was a great help for our work. <clears throat> I'm going to try to go through this summary of the peer review pretty quickly to leave more time for questions, so I'm going to be kind of short on details here, but try to capture the, the main points of the review. Next uh, slide. Um, so first, uh, overall findings with regards to the single species assessment. Uh, the panel concluded that the uh, BAM model, the assessment model, is a, is a mature, well-developed stock assessment model, that the conclusions that the stock assessment subcommittee reached were defensible, and that their examination of uncertainty with regards to the model was very thorough. Um, we agreed with the conclusion that Atlantic Menhaden are currently neither overfished nor experiencing overfishing. And we agreed that the reference points that are in place right now, I think they're referred to as interim reference points, are uh, entirely appropriate, at least until um, you move forward with the development of ecological reference points. <clears throat> Next slide. With regards to the uh, ERP assessment, um, just to sort of reiterate what several of you said in your comments after Matt's presentation, it was very, very impressive to see the uh, breadth of examination of candidate models that the, the ERP working group um, um, confronted or looked at. Um, we agree with the recommendations, the panel agreed with their recommendations about the preferred models for further work being the single species BAM model as well as the reduced complexity ecosystem model called NWAX mice. Um, and importantly, we felt like the analysis that the ERP group had done had reached a stage of credibility and thoroughness that it is time for the conversation to shift back to managers about what to do with this, these analytical tools, if you will, to inform the management decisions that you will continue to have to make. So now I'm going to quickly go through the terms of reference for the two reviews. Um, the first um, for the single species review, um, the panel was supportive of the choices that the SAS made with regards to data to include in their um, uh, model. We did note that the survey data that exists tend to be light on information on larger, older fish. As you know, the, all of the fishery independent surveys that are used in this assessment um, are not targeted at Menhaden. They're sort of opportunistically used. And the models are kind of sensitive, and one of the sensitivity analysis showed this, to the uh, uncertainty we have about the relative abundance of older Manhattan in the, the fishery. So one of the recommendations on that obviously was to add, try to add surveys that would represent larger and older fish. And um, we also made a technical recommendation about considering an alternative analytical method for combining the survey data. And I can elaborate on that more if you have questions. Next slide. Um, with regards to the assessment models, as I already said, we concluded that the model that they're using, the catch at age model, is a well-established, mature model. Um, we concluded that the major changes that Amy talked to, Dr. Schuler talked about earlier with regards to f how, how they're modeling fecundity and natural mortality were defensible and justified. And again, I can uh, speak to more to that if there are questions um, later. Um, we did note that the model, the, the way these models work is they use these complicated um, statistical fitting routines to try to estimate things like abundance from the data. And we did notice that the models had trouble sometimes finding a good answer, if you will. Um, and so one of our recommendations was that there could be some more work by the SAS to evaluate the stability of their stock assessment model estimates. We didn't consider this to be a serious issue, but there were a few results that they presented that were a bit troubling in that regard. Um, but we did conclude that the, the model is, is a, an appropriate tool for providing management advice. Next slide. 
Um, we were appreciative of the thorough and extensive efforts that the SAS went through to examine the sensitivity and uncertainty with regards to the model. Um, again, to reiterate a point I made earlier, the sensitivity analysis, one of the main take-homes from that was highlighting the importance of perhaps improving the assessment in the future by having better survey data for older fish. Um, but importantly, the conclusions, we agreed with the conclusions of the SAS that the stock status conclusions were robust to the uncertainties that they looked at. We did suggest, much to the annoyance of Dr. Schuler and some of the other SAS folks, that they should, we'd like them to continue to try to find ways to um, integrate the two methods of uncertainty analysis that they use. Uh, Dr. Schuler referred to an MCB method and an MCMC method that were sort of tackling two different parts of uncertainty. We suggested that they continue to struggle with trying to integrate those two into one. Next slide. Um, we agreed, with regards to the assessment results, we agreed with their conclusions about stock status. As I mentioned earlier, we agreed that the current reference points seem like appropriate ones for single species management, given what we know about Menhaden at this point. Um, but obviously, we would recommend that they, you plan for replacement of those reference points with ecological reference points. And we did have some suggestions about um, this, uh, there was some discussion earlier about prediction uh, uncertainty, recruitment or future prediction uncertainty, and we had some suggestions about uh, evaluating other methods for um, assessing the prediction skill. Next slide. Um, we generally supported what the SAS had to say about research and data collection in the future, and again, not to belabor this point too much, emphasize how valuable it would be to have an assessment tool that would inform you more about the older Menhaden in the population. <clears throat> and um, we wanted to emphasize, and I'm going to repeat this later, that um, it's imp it, the idea of doing a so-called management strategy evaluation, this was talked about in CDAR 40 as well, is a great idea, but this can become a monster, and so we urge the, the, the technical team to think very carefully about how to go about doing a management strategy evaluation so as not to make it um, a burden for management decision making in the future, and also to integrate it with, any, with a multi-species approach. So that's it for summary of the single species. On to the, oops, no, one more, sorry, um, timing really little to say there other than we agree with the, the uh, recommendations with regards to timing. <clears throat> Recognizing that if you are moving towards a multi-species integrated um, management strategy for Menhaden and the species that prey upon it, that that may imply something about the coordination of the timing of benchmarks for the various species that would be playing into that. Next slide. So with regards to the um, ecological reference points, um, there are a lot of data that informed the analysis that the, eco, the ERP working group uh, worked on. We were in general supportive of the choices that they made for data to include. One decision they had to make for some of the analyses was to include a, a data series, the reduction CPUE index. Um, that was not used in the single species assessment and we thought about that a little bit and agreed that this was the appropriate decision for them to make for the types of models that they were trying to fit. Um, we also felt that the, the, they were making the best possible use of the uh, admittedly limited diet information that we have for informing models like the NWAX mice model. Um, and uh, so we recommended that despite sort of feeling like they've done the best they can with the data that are available that in the future, because these diet data are, are spotty, are difficult to come by, especially for some of the species that haven't been um, looked at in closely in the model so far, um, that there might be a research priority for looking at new novel ways to get at diet information. And I mentioned uh, DNA metabarcoding as one of those, and I can elaborate on what that gobbledygook is if you're interested. Um, if there, there is going to be continued work with the multi-species catch at age model, and I'll refer to that later, um, there's probably needs to be more um, f comprehensive evaluation of the spiny dogfish data that would feed into that. And importantly, I mentioned that these uh, ecosystem models use a lot of data from a lot of different sources, and in contrast to the, the stock assessment model, the catch at age model, um, it's less straightforward how the data inform the models, and there can be a lot of 
sort of subjective decisions about what you're going to do with the data sources. And what that means is that it's really important that you have what I call here a data pedigree, some means of being able to go back and say, this is the data that we use, this is how we used it. And that is probably a pretty important thing if, if these ecosystem models are going to inform your management going forward. Next slide. Um, we were really impressed with the thoroughness and the, the breadth of evaluation of alternative models um, that they use to consider Manhattan as a forward species. Um, and in the end, we agreed with their recommendation to use the single species model BAM and the reduced EWE or NWAX mice model as the tools for development of the ERPs in the short term. But we also recommended that they continue to consider using this multi-species catch at age model. If that model could be developed to the point where it did effectively include predator-prey dynamics in ways that it doesn't currently, it would be a viable alternative to the EWE model as a tool for evaluating the ERPs, but it's not at that stage yet. Next slide. Um, again, I was, um, having been involved in CDAR 40, having participated in the Management Objectives Workshop in 2015, I was incredibly impressed with how far this group has, has gone in terms of thinking about translating those needs that were expressed then into analysis and tools to set the stage for a serious discussion about ecological reference points. Um, as has already been discussed, the examples that were in the report and that Matt talked about in his presentation, Dr. Sierra talked about in his presentation, should really be viewed by the rest of you as, as an illustration of how you go about doing this, not the answer. There's a lot more thinking that has to go into developing a set of reference points that effectively consider the um, many interactions that are potentially important for the management of Menhaden. Um, so it's time to begin this dialogue with between the technical experts and managers. Maybe you would argue that that dialogue began a lot of time ago. I should rephrase that. It's time to continue in earnest the dialogue between the technical people and managers to develop these reference points. Next slide. The uh, uncertainty analysis, sensitivity analysis for the ERP report kind of focused on the uh, NWAX mice model because of its um, the preference that the working group was leaning towards to use that going forward. And importantly, at the review panel meeting, we asked them to do an additional sensitivity analysis about um, how robust their conclusions were to different assumptions about the magnitude of predation mortality on uh, Menhaden, particularly from striped bass, and they went ahead and did that in real time while we were there and, and persuaded us that the model is pretty robust to uncertainty about that. I mentioned earlier that the diet data aren't fantastic, um, so there is uncertainty about the relative magnitude of predation mortality imposed by, by these predators, so that was <clears throat> useful and encouraging. Um, if, they, if this uh, multi-species catch at age model is going to be used in the future, it, they need to uh, think about doing more sensitivity analysis of that model than has been done so far. Next slide. Right now, with regards to stock status, the, the single species assessment is the best tool you have for uh, determining where the Manhattan population is relative to your objectives, um, but obviously the conversation today and, uh, and for the last few years has been about moving towards a, um, an ecological reference point. Next slide. Um, and this is my, my last slide. We generally, the panel generally agreed again with the recommendations of the working group with regards to future research activities. Um, in our peer review report, there are a number of specific recommendations for things they might want to consider doing, particularly with novel interpretations of diet data and things like that. And again, as I said at the end of my comments on the single species review, um, there are, uh, we do uh, favor the idea of using to a tool like a management strategy evaluation to explore management alternatives, but this has to be done with caution because it can explode on you. Um, but it is a really valuable tool for looking at the trade-offs that you're going to have to be looking at with regards to setting management targets for the different species that interact within this sort of Manhattan complex. I think that's my last slide. Yes, it is. So at this point, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Um, are there questions? I guess I'd uh, first like to return to Roy's question earlier about natural mortality. You heard Dr. Jones say that 
the decision by the um, SAS was both defensible and justified. So I guess I just want to make sure that, um, Roy, that uh, you had the answer to the question that, that you asked earlier, um, or if you had any follow-up about the natural mortality value. It sounds like that's all we can do with that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Estes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, you all did a really good job. I don't understand probably 10% of what you did, but the 10% that I understand is I'm pretty impressed. I would like to kind of dig a little bit deeper into what Roy asked about, and that is because I expect that we are going to have some stakeholders. We know how we do things, is that we have stakeholders that have um, impressions about what they want to see when we do some, when our scientists do some things, and they sometimes are a little bit biased in how they see it. So I want to, I want to tell you what my understanding of the natural mortality issue is. Um, first of all, I do believe that debate is very important in science, and I think that we have gotten a little bit away from that in some scientific areas. And so I appreciate Dr. Alt um, sending his email. But let me tell you what my understanding of it is, and if I am wrong, then please correct me. First of all, after I read after I read what he wrote, it kind of did not erode my confidence in what you all did. And the basis of that is this: is I think he was comparing two things that are not the same. So in his email, he questions natural mortality, and he had a graphic in his email that showed that the natural mortality that we are using for Menhaden was much higher than the natural mortalities that are estimated from theoretical things like maximum age, and he had a graphic on there, but I believe that for estimating the maximum age of those various species that he had, that he's looking at mortality over the life of the species. In Menhaden, I think I heard a little bit earlier that we were looking at natural mortality between age one and two. Well, those are not the same things. They are not comparable. I think we would expect to see, especially for a fish that is eaten by a lot of other fishes, that the natural mortality of those fish would be much higher when they are younger than when they are older. And so that's the basis for my kind of rejecting his debate. Am I accurate in the way I look at this? So yeah, I think that is definitely, the graph is, is a little misleading in that he is plotting the, one, the age 1.5 natural mortality over where the age 10 natural mortality, or a fish that lived sort of the maximum age 10 mortality would be. So that is a little, um, it is still higher than what you would predict using these life history based analyses. Um, although Sten's recent re-estimation of Honig's life history based parameters also did increase that natural mortality. So those other graphs, oh, their plots are probably a little outdated as well, and it should be higher. Um, and I think in addition to keep in mind is, you know, those species in, are generally not forage fish species on that plot. And so it's not just a matter of how long does that species live, but the size of the species, its role in the ecosystem. And you wouldn't necessarily expect, even if Menhaden do live um, to 10 or 12 years old, um, 10 being the maximum age we've seen in the population, um, you wouldn't expect them to have the same natural mortality as something as large as a bluefish or a grouper that reaches a very large maximum size, whereas Menhaden are preyed on throughout their entire lifespan. And I think it's, I think it's, it's important to remember that most of those other species, most of those other stock assessments use estimates of M based on life history approaches, right? Whereas in Menhaden, the big difference is, is that we have a tagging analysis of over a million fish. So it's actually based on data not on theoretical life history, how long are you going to live, but on actual data that we gather while doing it. Eric Reed. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I have to ask this question. It's a crazy question, but it goes to a point John Clark raised earlier that, you know, it seems like when Menhaden are at a in a pretty good place, striped bass, bluefish, some other fish are maybe not in such a good place, which is where we are right now. So that leads me to ask the, the question, Have what's the consideration of Menhaden as a predator of the larval stages of all our problem children? So, um, 
it's a good question. As you know, menhaden are filter feeders as, um, as adults, so they're filtering whatever's in there out. They also, as juveniles themselves, are feeding directly on larvae, eggs, other zooplankton. Um, so there is the potential for them to feed on certainly other predator species. However, I would also say that while menhaden are high now, fishing mortality on those other predator species is all, has also been high. So that yes, as the striped bass population was increasing, it was also experiencing increasing fishing mortality. And in addition, the recruitment on striped bass had dropped. So we were in a period of high F and low recruitment for striped bass that contributed to the decline we see now. And so I think it emphasizes the fact that Menhaden, the Menhaden board can put these other predator species in a position to succeed by providing enough forage for them to maintain um, a strong, healthy population and not to increase natural mortality. But it cannot counteract the effects of overfishing or of periods of low recruitment or other environmental hazards to striped bass and weak fish. It's possible that theoretically possible that Menhaden are in there sucking everything up. Um, I don't know if we have the data. I would suggest that we focus on F on striped bass first and then worry about the fishing effects or of Menhaden. Um, but, but yeah, it's a very complex system and there's a lot going on here. I believe that uh, Dr. John Hare might have something to add to the discussion on natural mortality. So I'll ask him to come to the public microphone. Thank you very much. Um, it's an observation, um, just making it from the perspective of the Science Center director where we do a lot of stock assessments. Um, if I, I don't, I'm not going to speak to the specific issue. Um, if, I, if I heard the conversation correctly this morning, the, the stock assessment group used a uh, natural mortality rate that was in a peer-reviewed paper, um, and then they used that in their assessment and then that assessment was peer reviewed. Um, and so you have a scientific process which is working forward, scientifically peer reviewed, empirical based estimate of natural mortality that was used in an assessment which was then scientifically peer reviewed. Um, and so I think, you know, we, from the Science Center perspective, we put a lot of value on that peer reviewed process. Now, I certainly have a huge amount of respect for Dr. Alt. Um, he is a stock assessment scientist, has worked in a number of different regions, so his, his sort of contribution to the conversation is highly valued. Um, and I think comparing or sort of as a research recommendation for Menhaden or for the general community, as we get more empirical based observations of natural mortality based on tagging. In Menhaden's case, it was traditional tagging, largest tagging database, tagging effort undertaken perhaps. Um, but with electronic tags, there are more of these empirical based natural mortality rates being calculated. I think a research recommendation could be to compare and think about how these empirical estimates of natural mortality compare to these more life history based uh, maximum age, maximum size type estimates. Um, but I just wanted to reflect that, you know, the, what the Menhaden assessment is using is a peer reviewed estimate in the primary scientific literature and then a peer reviewed stock assessment value. And I think there's a lot of value in the peer reviewed system. So thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Dr. Hare. Uh, coming back to the board, uh, Justin Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm curious about the Vader model. We heard a couple times this morning that that's a model that we shouldn't walk away from, that we should continue to look into. Um, what's the perceived or you know enhanced utility or different utility we would get out of that model versus the NWAX model, and, and what will it take to get there, to get that model to the point where it might be ready for management use? Um, well, I think the first thing you have to do is fire Jason McNamee so that he can go back to continue to work on it from his current job. Um, it's a, um, the, 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 the appeal from the panel, the peer review panel's point of view of the, the, the Vader model is that like the BAM model, it is sort of directly informed by stock assessment data for the species that are included in the model, um, as opposed to in these uh, EcoPath with EcoSim or EWE food web models where um, not to get into the details, there's a little bit more of an art to fitting those models and making them agree with the data that you have. Um, it also 
has a attractive feature if you can make it work that it you can be as as Dr. Schuler has with the BAM model you're able to be a lot more formal and rigorous with regards to uncertainty which helps you to de address these issues of risk that people were talking about earlier the the deficient the main deficiency of that model right now is that it hasn't um, there's sort of more work to do on the defining the connections between the predators and the prey so the model is doing a pretty decent job of simultaneously modeling the dynamics of the, all of the, the predator species and the prey species, but it's kind of weak on how those interact. And that comes back to this diet information. Um, I think that uh, in terms of the data, the data need that would best improve the, the prospects for using that, this model is better diet information. And it, it's just hard. It, they're, they're, they're challenging technically. Um, it's challenging to build a single species statistical catch at age model. There aren't very many examples of multi-species statistical catch at age models. So you're kind of at the cutting edge of assessment modeling. But it, I think the merits of it in terms of a somewhat more objective, um, uh, more uh, the, the greater ability to, to say something about uncertainty with regards to the things that you're trying to estimate make justify the recommendation that it's highly worthy of continued exploration. Follow up? Thank you. So just as a follow up, since you brought up diet data as one of the major deficiencies for that model, could you talk a little bit about meta barcoding, which you brought up earlier in your presentation? Well, I'm not a geneticist, so first that caveat. But basically, what the, the idea, and you've probably heard about this, read maybe popular articles about it, about being able to take stomach contents of predators and instead of just putting them under the microscope and saying, oh, that's a, that's a menhaden and that's a herring, you actually c analyze the DNA that's in the stomachs of the predators. And the DNA meta barcoding is kind of a you know a, a label on the DNA of that's species specific and allows you to say that we found this much DNA of species X and this much of species Y. It raises the question of you know did that was that because you found menhaden DNA in the stomach does that mean there were ten menhaden in the stomach or one? There's questions like that, but it's it's being used and there are other tools too things related to. Um, fatty acid profiles in stomachs and so on. There are various tools that are being used by ecosystem scientists to get a better handle on diet um, that use tools that don't involve just cutting open stomach, the old way of cutting open stomachs and looking at the stomach contents under the microscope. Yeah, just one of the, the big issues that we run into with all of these diet studies is that the largest component of the diet is unidentified fish. And so that doesn't really help us. And I think these techniques help us get at better understanding of what that unidentified fish actually is. Thank you. A uh, question to uh, staff. Does it follow naturally, and, and considering the research recommendations, does it follow naturally from the assessment um, that the technical committee will be looking at the, the list of research recommendations and coming up with a plan for the types of things that they can address on that list prior to the next assessment? Um, <clears throat> it's a good question. So, you know, typically when we embark on the next uh, benchmark assessment, we evaluate the research recommendations that have been uh, provided, what kind of progress have we made. Um, certainly the TC s starts having interactions about that list uh, up until then to see, um, you know, what might be the crux of the next benchmark if we haven't made progress on that, what kind of impacts is that going to have. So the dialogue will, will definitely continue. I think that would be particularly useful for you know things where you have to s thinking about the the inadequacy of older aged fish. That's something that you have to start to correct before you're getting to the the assessment. And and I think Sarah may have a comment on that. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in also that we have the overarching ASMFC research recommendations, and that that feeds into things like recommendations for funding and for projects outside of it. So obviously the TC. Um, isn't going to be able to create a survey to handle diet <laughs> data for us, but that will also be put on a list. Great, thank you. Um, last, we're going to go to Lynn Fagley. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's possible that this question um, should be forwarded to the next uh, uh, section, but um, Dr. Jones, thank you for your review. And the slide that's up, you um, 
did mention that the example ERP that we were given is an, an example, and it's not the answer, and uh, that an MSE would be um, a worthwhile approach, but you urged, um, as it says there, uh, caution so it doesn't explode. And after what happened yesterday with straight bass, I think there's a propensity for things to explode. And so I wonder with your experience, um, you know, as we're trying to grapple with this incredible information we've been given, do you have any sage counsel on how we, um, how we would, what do you do to craft an MSE that doesn't explode? That's a really big question, but I, I just, I'm curious, you know, if you have any idea, you know, counsel. I guess the the only advice, which is perhaps a bit, um, I don't know, well, no, it, it's solid advice. Is is engage people who have done this before, and to, there's a caveat on that in that it, you could argue that what we're advocating that the technical committee do here is something that no one has done before in some sense. But um, for example, the um, northeast. Fishery Science Center recently, a couple of years ago, did a MSE for uh, Atlantic herring. Um, not really um, a perfect analog to what we're sort of advocating for here, but some hard won experience from the scientists that were involved in that um, would be really valuable. Uh, there are people you know, all over the world now who are grappling with this very same question for a whole bunch of other species, and I think that would be the first piece of advice I would give is that you reach out to those who have already been down this path a little bit for advice. Um, the other thing that I would uh, emphasize, which is probably a little bit less about avoiding the thing exploding, but, but maximizing the likelihood that whatever you do will actually have an impact on management is don't just assign the technical team, technical group, or whatever they're called, to do this and then report back. The MSC process has to involve managers because otherwise you'll end up with something that's scientifically intriguing and the managers won't want to have anything to do with it because they will have no ownership of it. And in my experience working with MSC type exercises in other uh, jurisdictions, what has really caused them to make a difference has been the involvement of managers as well as um, scientists in that process. So we have uh, bumped up against our allotted time uh, for our discussion on this. Um, I would like to thank each of our presenters for their, their efforts and um, taking all of our questions, helping us to work through some of the details of the assessments. Um, certainly there's more questions, um, but I, I hope that the board is in a position that we could look now for a, a motion to accept the 2019 benchmark stock assessments and peer review reports for management use. Motion by Spud Woodward, thank you. Seconded by Malcolm Rhodes. Just give staff a moment to get that on the board. Okay, so we have a motion to accept the Atlantic Menhaden single species ERP and peer review reports for management use. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, is there any opposition to the motion? We will consider that approved by uh, consent. And uh, do people need a couple minute break before we move on to management discussions? Sounds like a good idea. Okay, let's try to be back um, in five minutes, 10.35. <laughs>
If the board can please return to their seats. <laughs> we'll get started in another minute. Can the board please p take their seats? We're going to come back into session. All right, we are back to item five on the uh, agenda, which is to consider management response to 2019 benchmark stock assessments. Um, you know, we may have just gone through the easy part, it would seem, and now we have to talk about how we're gonna use these, the assessments um, and incorporate them into management results or the management program. Uh, staff, uh, Max and Katie are gonna start us off with a presentation that's been alluded to that's gonna look at some of the, the short and long-term considerations. I think Max is up first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, we, we took the liberty of putting a few slides together to help focus discussion on, you know, where do we go next with all this information. Um, the first thing I wanted to sort of rein in is that there, there are sort of short-term and long-term goals that the, the board has been grappling with. Um, the short ones being what Madam Chair just brought up, you know, identify ERPs for Menhaden and try to incorporate those into the management program in a timely fashion. But there's also these long-term uh, discussions that are going on, continuing to pursue the, the full, you know, realized implementation of ecosystem-based fishery management, um, starting discussions at this board, but of course, initiating higher level discussions with the policy board or, or the commission as a whole this has been talked about a little bit already today. Um, but it, you know, these two things can be done in tandem. You're not parking one on the shelf necessarily. You can focus on the short term and continue discussions on the long term. So just to recap uh, from the reports this morning, you know, there is no one right ERP for Menhaden because the, the final harvest level is really dependent on the objectives that this board and other management boards have for the ecosystem. Um, how do you want the Menhaden fishery to look like? How do you want the biomass in its fishery to look like? How do you want the predator biomasses in their fisheries to look like? These all play in to find, hone in on that, that right answer. And so the ERP work group has provided this tool um, the BAM model along with the NWAX mice model to sort of evaluate the trade-offs of the different assumptions or the different objectives um, and, and uh, find that, that, that sweet spot. So this is where I'm actually going to transition to Katie and she'll uh, go over the example and some other potential examples that we might want to look at. Right. 
so th as, as a reminder, this was the example that the ERP work group developed for this assessment, um, where the maximum F on Atlantic Menhaden that would sustain striped bass at their biomass target when you fished striped bass at their F target was defined as the target. And then similarly, you could define a threshold as the maximum F on Menhaden that would sustain striped bass at their threshold um, when they're fished at their F target. However, in this example, it's assumed that all of the other species, both the predator and the alternative prey species, are being fished at 2017 levels. So basically, stop the model where, start the model where we stopped and project forward. And so obviously there's implications for where you keep those other predators in this, in this ecosystem. Because as we discussed earlier with bluefish and weakfish, there's competition effects, there's interaction effects between these predators as well as between the predators and menhaden. So what we want to do is recommend sort of a set of um, additional scenarios to explore. So we can go to the next slide and look at some potential other scenarios. So in this case, I've laid out four scenarios. We've already done the first one. That's where you fish striped bass at their F target and keep everything else at status quo. Um, and this status quo means that bluefish is experiencing overfishing and weak fish, meanwhile, is below its target, as is spiny dogfish. So um, the, another option to consider would be option two here, where you fish everything at their F target and see where the population ends up and see what the values of menhaden are. That is, do we need to leave more menhaden in the ocean if we're rebuilding all of these predator species? or in the case of spiny dogfish, fishing them down to their F target, to their biomass target, where they're currently above the threshold right now. Um, an another option would be to look at what happens if you fish everything at the F threshold and try to keep these species at their F threshold or their F targets. That is, if you increase fishing mortality on striped bass, you have to leave more menhaden in the water to keep them at the same biomass because you're sort of, it's a trade-off between fishing mortality on striped bass and natural mortality that comes from not enough menhaden. So if you can balance those two, you can keep them at a specific in theory in these long-term projections at your biomass target or your biomass threshold. And so while the striped bass board may strive to get striped bass back to their target, is that possible? Is it more likely that we would be fishing closer to the threshold? Um, so these are kind of scenarios that the board should examine. And the fourth one here is an example where we're saying, let's fish striped bass and bluefish and Atlantic herring at their F targets and fish weak fish and spiny dogfish at their status quo values because status quo for weak fish represents a relatively low F and a high natural mortality. And it's unlikely that management is gonna do anything about that into the future. In addition, we're sort of underfishing uh, spiny dogfish right now because of market pressure and market demand. So that even if we try to increase fishing pressure on spiny dogfish, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of room for that to move. So is it more realistic to keep them at this current status quo scenario? So these are just four scenarios that we think will help the man management board sort of bound the problem. The overall finding that your ERP reference points need to be lower than your single species reference points is not likely to change. But then there becomes questions of, well, what is the exact value? Is it 0.19? Is it 0.20? What and how does that translate into quota and management recommendations? And so we'd like to provide some additional scenarios for you to look at to help you understand the bounds of this problem. And understand how our assumptions about what's going to be happening with this ecosystem into the future actually play out for your reference points. So what we're looking for, if we go to the next slide, um, from the, the board is some guidance to make sure that these scenarios are what you're really looking for. So are these proposed scenarios acceptable to you? Um, are you satisfied with focusing the analysis on the existing FMP values um, or should other values be considered? That is, we're really focusing on what's in the FMPs right now rather than saying what should the reference point for striped bass be? What should the reference point for bluefish be? So that helps limit the problem, but it does limit our ability to evaluate, fully evaluate the trade-offs here. And is there any other scenarios that the board would like to see to help them understand this problem, to help them understand these trade-offs better? Um, we can bring these proposed scenarios back to the board in May. Um, 
additional work um, and possibly you know a couple of extra scenarios that the board would like to see if you guys go crazy and request 10 different scenarios that's going to take a little longer but we can definitely bring sort of a limited suite of, of analyses back to the table um, in May and show you some of the things that we've already shown you so those heat map plots um, heat map plots those rainbow plots for multiple different species and analysis of where all of these predators uh, end up and prey end up relative to their targets and so on in May so, and then I think Max is going to take over to talk about kind of how that actually translates into management. Right. So bringing it back to the, you know, short-term and long-term timelines, um, the board has the ability to change the reference points through board action, you know, at a, a majority vote at this meeting or any future meeting or through adaptive management, those being the addendum and amendment processes. And of the difference here is time, timelines. Um, board actions are pretty quick. Addendums and amendments take a little bit longer. There's also varying levels of public input in the adaptive management process. Um, but also, again, there are these bigger discussions, longer term discussions that uh, the board can continue to make progress on. Um, talking about MSC, we've had some conversation about that already. And, you know, do we want to have higher level discussions at the commission with the policy board or talk about, you know, how we might integrate uh, multi species decision making? So that's really all we have to set the stage for your discussion. But um, I guess, Madam Chair, it's uh, your, yours to rein in. Are there any questions just to what staff has said about process? Lynn? Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just had one uh, quick question for Katie because it's, it's, I'm, I'm confused. So bluefish, did I understand you to say we're overfishing bluefish right now? And is there a target for bluefish? I, I <laughs> All good questions. So in the current month, ERP model, because we only went through 2017, in this scenario, bluefish is experiencing overfishing and was overfished. The most recent stock assessment update for bluefish went through 2018 and was no longer experiencing overfishing. Um, bluefish does not have an F target. Uh, the assessment had looked at using 0.9 times FMSY is a potential target, so we would probably continue that for this analysis. There is also no biomass target for bluefish. Uh, they use one half the BMSY proxy as a threshold. However, we could consider, which we define sort of a target as the BMSY proxy for bluefish. Um, but you know, th those are things that the board could certainly consider or think about when we bring that back. Questions or, yeah, um, I guess there are questions. All right, <laughs> John Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair. As long as you have that uh, table up there, Katie, um, if you look at the species altogether, is one or another going to be kind of the choke point that sort of would set the, the reference point lower? I mean, how are you going to consider them in total to come up with a single unique uh, reference point? That's a good question. Um, so as I said, we've sort of focused on striped bass here because we know it's the most sensitive to the menhaden levels. So bluefish could probably sustain a larger menhaden fishing mortality and still remain at its target or threshold, whereas that would cause striped bass to start to decline. So I think that would be one of the things we would look for is, is there what's the combination of F that keeps the most sensitive predator at its target or at its threshold? However, there's certainly um, the possibility that there is no magic number for menhaden that would keep all of them at their target together. So obviously we talked a little bit about the interactions between some of these species in terms of um, bluefish men and weak fish and striped bass are, well all of these are competitors for menhaden but they also prey on each other as, especially as juveniles and so that um, fishing one species more aggressively will benefit another species. Um, and so there's a trade-off there. So we can come back and what we'll show you is basically where do all of these predators fall out relative to their target under different menhaden scenarios and under different um, single species F scenarios so that you can sort of help evaluate 
does this look like what we want the ecosystem or what's the best ecosystem that we can get out of this um, fishing mortality rate for Menhaden, you guys unfortunately are the ones who's going to have to decide what best is. But we can definitely use the existing reference points as sort of a framework or a starting point for evaluating where we should go. Jim Estes? This sounds probably like, even to me it does, probably an ignorant question, but I fear not. Um, so we talked a little bit yesterday about performance. So we've just stepped, we're going to step into a, across the door into a new world here. How do we evaluate this very complicated thing to see if it is performing like we want it to? Well, obviously we're going to be updating this um, this sort of approach every while we're doing bench uh, while we're doing update assessments for uh, for Menhaden. So we'll be able to we'll be able to look at the behavior um, as we go through the update process, just like we would for Menhaden always. Does that make sense, Richie White? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, looking at this chart, I'm trying to think how we integrate. Um, our lack of ability to make final decisions on herring, dogfish, and bluefish. And how, to, <laughs> how does that work into this system? Well, so I'll, I'll jump in and, so, and then we can sort of talk about this. Is number one, we are going to talk about this at the policy board because it's true that you guys have no control over, well, some of you are the same people, but we all understand that you know you, the striped bass board is the one who's making the decisions about striped bass, how you manage striped bass, um, how you get to the striped bass F target, and Menhaden board, the Menhaden board doesn't really have a say in that process. So if we fish at our F target for Menhaden, our ERP target for Menhaden, and striped bass does not recover, is that a failure on the Menhaden board, or is that a failure on the striped bass board, or is that a problem with a larger ecosystem or biological problem that we're missing that that t knob to turn is a question that I think the policy board is going to have to figure out. However, I think the Menhaden board can sort of take this first step as thinking of, of it as we will put these species in a position to succeed on the basis of what Menhaden can do for them and for the ecosystem. It's up to the rest of the boards to make sure that fishing mortality on those other species is not going to conflict with our ability to provide forage for them. So I'd like up. to, oh, go ahead, Richie, follow up. Thank you. Um, I was meaning more uh, that the service um, and the council uh, is involved in some of these species more than we are, you know, or as we kind of get to adopt what they, you know, what they do. So how does how do we integrate that if we're going down the road on striped bass, let's say, and uh, you know they ex want to expand dogfish, you know, for an example, that then interferes with uh, our striped bass management? How, how do how do we work with that? So that is, that's a policy board discussion. I'm going to say, so like how, what's the net, so I think we think of this as, this is a series of steps. So right now we're ready to take the first step in ecosystem-based management, which is trying to consider Menhaden's role as a forage fish when we set quotas for Menhaden. Um, there is a number of steps that are going to have to come after this. Right now, these scenarios basically only include the existing reference points for these species. Um, so how can we bring this board into conversations about those reference points with other boards here at the commission, with our federal and state partners? That's a, a discussion for the policy board. I think the discussion for this board is how do you want to take the next steps um, before or after that conversation happens? Thanks, Katie. So I would like to focus the board's attention on that that shorter term goal of uh, looking at the example ERP that's been provided and the alternatives that have been um, suggested um, for development. Um, so I'd look to the board to help provide some direction as to potential paths we could take with those. If anyone's, Allison Colton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, if it pleases the chair, I have a motion that I'd like to offer to sort of move us in that direction. Go ahead, please. We'll get staff, I believe, has a copy of it to bring it up. So
So another one of these very long motions, but in effect, um, it is to adopt the example ERP that we saw today. Um, there's probably a necessity for me to read this into the record, right? <laughs> okay. Um, so move to adopt an Atlantic Menhaden ecological reference point F target equal to the maximum F on Atlantic Menhaden that maintains Atlantic striped bass at its biomass target when striped bass is fished at its F target and all other ERP species as defined in the uh, wax mice model, can we call it that, are fished at their status quo F rates. Um, and two, an Atlantic Menhaden ecological reference point F threshold equal to the maximum F on Atlantic Menhaden that maintains Atlantic striped bass at its biomass threshold when striped bass is fished at its F target and other ERP species as defined in the NOAX mice model are fished at their status quo F rates. And if I can get a second, I'm happy to uh, speak to that. Second to be, second to by Shree Patterson. Go ahead, Allison. Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, given the presentation that we just saw, there may be some folks around this table who think that this motion is a little premature, but um, the reason I have sort of put this forward is I think what the work group has given to us in this example ERP and as it's been described in the assessment report in the discussion today is sort of a really viable option as a first step in the short term towards implementing a larger ecosystem-based fisheries management for Menhaden through this commission. Um, the ERP, the example ERP, as we've discussed, focuses on striped bass, the most sensitive species in the model, um, and also, you know, currently reflects our best approximation of the reality of what's going on with those other species in the ecosystem. I think it can be valuable to look at some of those other scenarios that have been put forward by the work group and maybe discussed by others. Um, the one thing that I did want to caution us against, though, is, is going down a rabbit hole. Um, there are near infinite combinations, I believe, um, if, especially if we start stepping out of the framework that of using um, management objectives as defined by the species' respective boards. Um, and so I think that in the short term, this presents a, a viable option for us to dip our toe in that pool of ERPs while we continue to have these really important discussions about process and model development and refinement um, as we move forward through the policy board and other discussions that we have here. So thank you. Discussion on the motion? <laughs> Justin Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around the part at the end of both of those bullets there, the status quo F rates. And certainly, it, I'm assuming bluefish is included in the ERP species, and, and we know that you know we took action this year, bluefish with bluefish to try to reduce F. Um, so I'm wondering, I guess I'm trying to wrap my head around what that means. So if you adopt a Menhaden ecological reference point that should be adequate to maintain striped bass at say its target while we're fishing the other species at status quo F, what does it mean when we then relax F on one of those species? Does that mean that that Medhaden reference point is now more conservative than it needed to be or less um, because as you relax F theoretically those other predators should become more abundant and exert more predatory demand on Menhaden so now you need more Menhaden than you thought because there's now competition or is it that now there's more room for natural mortality to increase for those predators because you've relaxed F Although you don't want overall mortality to stay the same because you're trying to get the population. I'm trying to work all this through what it means that we're essentially setting a reference point here where we're allowing for fishing these other species at their status quo F rate, but not allowing for reductions of F, which are likely to occur, at least for one of those species in the near term. Welcome to our world. Um, I, think, I think on some level, you can you can sort of see where some of these reference points would go, um, but this is this is the example that we have so far. Um, if you want to see other things, there, you know, we we've, we've done that. We're going to be able to do that for you in May. Um, so, it's 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 going to be it's going to be an interesting discussion um, for you guys as as you as you move forward. But you know, you can you can go with the sort of 
bite-sized approach that we've uh, we've you know suggested to you so far. I was just going to add on to that. Um, you know, I think the example scenarios up on that were up on the screen can sh sort of show you what you're getting at. Is uh, we in something if 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 tasked, we could bring that to you in May of different F assumptions on these predators. How does that change? the outputs of the model, how does your ERP value change when you fish your predators at different levels, you know, what does that mean for menhaden harvest? So I think that is something that we can show you um, if, if tasked. Richie White. Brian Plumley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I want to step back for just a minute and ask a question that I probably should have raised earlier. And I think in response to Eric, you asserted this, but I need a little more clarification. There's a conclusion that we cannot get to the acceptable F target for striped bass without independent striped bass management, no matter what you do with Menhaden. That's a very firm conclusion, probably the only firm conclusion I've heard. Is it similar in that we cannot, without increasing the availability of Menhaden, reach the acceptable striped bass F target from where we are? Have, have we decided that? I, I've, I've not. So good question. So this is, I think, where the um, additional scenarios come in a little bit right now if we manage to bring striped bass F target down to down to its F target and we continue to fish Menhaden where we've been fishing it right now which is approximately close to the ERP target because of that large buffer we've put in then yes in the long term you would expect striped bass to rebuild to its target as long as you're also keeping those other species the those focal species at their current sort of average into the future um, we haven't explored what would happen if you bring all of those other species to their targets or to their thresholds, but there is the potential kind of in the long term to rebuild striped bass under this, this specific scenario. Yes. Megan Ware. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess speaking to the motion, I'll start by I agree with the sentiment that the motion about kind of adopting ecosystem reference points is a high priority for this board. Um, certainly throughout the development of Amendment 3, we heard a lot of public comment in support of that. So I do want to acknowledge that. Um, I think this is also a lot of information to process, and it's important to understand and explore the assumptions and parameters in this ecosystem reference point. Um, and I'll also note that the policy board is starting their discussion tomorrow, as, been, as has been mentioned, about incorporating ecosystem management kind of into the commission framework. And I think that's an important discussion to be having concurrently. Um, so with that, I would like to make a motion to postpone. And I think the staff has my language. Um, so I'll read this into the record. If I get a second, I'll kind of speak to the specifics. Um, but move to postpone until after completion of the following task. Task the Ecological Reference Point Workgroup with the following analysis to better understand the parameters and outputs of the example ERP. The work group is asked to present this analysis at the May ASMFC meeting. Using the existing example ERP framework, modify the assumptions on the other species such that they are fish at their F target as opposed to their F2017 rate, and then reproduce figures 144 through 148. Using the existing example ERP framework, modify the assumptions on the other species such that they are fished at their F threshold as opposed to F2017. Again, reproduce figures 144 through 148. Using the existing example ERP framework, modify the assumptions on the other species such that bluefish and herring are fished at their F target, while spiny dogfish and weakfish are fished at their F2017. Again, reproduce figures 144 through 148. So our second to the motion, John Clark. Megan, uh, would you like to speak to your motion? Yeah, just a few things. Um, I'd like to highlight that this analysis is intended to come back in May, so I don't want this to seem like this is kicking the can down the road. Um, I think this is kind of doing our due diligence in what's been provided to us and doing it in a timely fashion. 
Um, and then these three bullet points, I believe, are what was on the screen for the, the table that staff presented. Um, so that's kind of what I'm trying to get at. Thank you, uh, Megan. Uh, John, did you want to speak to the motion as a seconder? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I thank Megan for this uh, motion. I agree that the ERP approach is very interesting and we're proceeding in that way, but we're looking at uh, reference points that are approximately 40% lower than our single species reference points where Menhaden are not overfished and overfishing is not occurring. So I just think we, as Megan pointed out, should take a little time to look further into this before we make that our new management uh, target and threshold. Thank you, John. There is a number of individuals who had raised their hand on the prior motion, um, and we'll, I'll go to them. Adam Nowalski. Question I have right now is, what is, what does it mean to this board, and ultimately the public in terms of harvest levels, by adopting the ERP reference points? now in May sometime this year we've given advice that we should be using the BAM and the ERP together in some capacity I'm not clear on how we're going to do that especially if they give us slightly differing advice so if we adopt the ERP reference points as the first motion suggests today or bring that motion back up in May after this other work is done what is that actually going to mean in terms of specifications on Menhaden specifically uh, thanks for that question so I think the process for tax setting spe fishery specifications wouldn't change all that much you're now just using a different um, F target for Menhaden to run those projections and, and find the tack that achieves that under certain probabilities whatever guidance is given from the board so the tax setting process wouldn't change follow up Adam so what that would suggest is when we set tax that staff would or TC would run a series of projected tax both based on both the BAM reference points and ERP reference points that we adopt and then we would select whichever number we want to or would we first have to decide whether we want to see only ERP based tax or only BAM based tax? So it, the projections would be done using an extension of the BAM model, is my understanding. Um, and anyone can jump in if I'm wrong. But the first step would be to identify your ERP definition, which corresponds to a value which we would then use for the BAM model to make projections and provide a suite for the board uh, to consider, attack options for the board to consider. Allison Colden. Um, I forgot I raised my hand, but I do have a question. Um, so, um, you know, I think that if I'm reading these correctly these are the scenarios put forward by the ERP work group for modeling is that correct correct in the in the table that was uh, in part, part of staff's presentation sure um, and I think it goes back to a larger question of process and what is appropriate action for this board versus the policy board versus some other um, configuration that the Commission decides is appropriate moving forward but in my viewpoint, um, some of these scenarios that were put forward, I think can be very informative in framing sort of the spectrum of possibilities that exist. Um, you know, all F target, all F threshold can sort of put um, bounds on um, things and give us information that would be useful. But um, I think it's really important to maintain some sort of semblance 
of connection to the reality of where things are. I think we can we can hope that we fish all of our predators at their F target, and I hope that that is our our general goal at this commission. Um, but it seems to me that that's not currently where we are. Um, and the assessment report did mention that they chose the striped bass F target because there was this pending action that we went through yesterday at the striped bass board to make that happen in the 2020 fishing season. And so I'm just sort of con trying to grasp at what helpful, actionable information these scenarios will get us if they are sort of including an implicit judgment on uh, the objectives of the other species, which I feel like should be better left to those other species boards. I'll take part of that and hopefully people up at the table can, can help me out here. So, you know, I think um, the board is going to grapple with the right assumptions of where the environment really is versus how these separate management programs aim to achieve various targets. And it can be somewhat reactive in assuming, right, making an assumption that the different management programs are going to act accordingly to achieve their F targets. Or, I guess, the alternative is that this management board makes a, um, a different assumption of, you know, which is what some of these scenarios are trying to do, that we might never see F at the F target for this particular species management program. So it's really on the board to hone in on the appropriate assumption, balancing what is probably going, what the ecosystem currently looks like or might look like in the short term versus, you know, referring to the targets and thresholds that have already been identified in those programs. It's, it's important to understand that like, the, like when we went back and we were doing this modeling approach, we, we basically left everything at status quo with the exception of striped bass. One, because it was more sensitive, but, but we also didn't know where, where the management of those other species was going. Since we've done that, decisions have been made on some of those species, including bluefish. Um, like, you know, Atlantic herring can't be over, can't be overfished. I mean, uh, can't have overfishing occurring because it's also, it's also a federally managed species. Um, the same thing for, for spiny dogfish. So there are some differences between the example ERP we've given um, and, again, what reality is currently right now. Follow up, Allison? Turn myself up. Um, I just wanted to follow up and acknowledge that we heard this morning that bluefish, bluefish in particular has had um, a management change and um, I do think that could be something important to look at within the context of the existing um, ERP framework um, and I'm not sure about sort of the status of, of herring management action um, but um, you know that could be that is one that we have already discussed has had some changes since then. So that would be the, the one scenario I think could be valuable. Sorry, we're kind of sidebarring over here as you were going, Allison. But I just want to point out that example number three on this motion is getting to your point um, about setting bluefish as at their F target and more uh, creating the current environment that we would expect out there for the predators that are involved in, in this particular model. So if that helps at all. Bill Hyatt. So um, my comment's been largely addressed by this substitute motion, but um, you know, the worst possible outcome would be for us to adopt new reference points, go through scenario planning, get results that are significantly different, and then appear to be all over the map. So absent any sort of reassurance that, that in fact, those scenarios are going to result in subtle changes rather than significant changes, uh, I would support this substitute motion. Steve Train to the motion. Pass. Um, Jim Gilmore. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I support the substitute motion and not oppose the, uh, the initial motion, but um, for I think some of the comments that have already been made. Um, there's a lot of information that we've gone through. I think the download speed for my computer just for the assessments took like many, many minutes. Going through this stuff is, uh, and, and again, I commend all you guys. This has been an incredible amount of uh, great work. But we're kind of looking at, I, I understand, I'm going to brag, I think I understand 15% of this, Jim. You said 10. And um, I really got to get a better comfort level before we start adopting these formally. Um, there's the scientific part of it, but then there's also other points that have been raised by Richie about the interactions with different species boards and things like that. So the actual the, the management practicalities of this, I really got to digest a little bit better before we start, you know, putting this into full swing. So, um, and again, we're at a, a, a fishing mortality for Menhaden. We're not at any risk right now. It's actually. Um, I guess below or because of whatever accident we had in terms of our you know, conservatism, whatever. So I think um, a little more time to go through this and to get some better analysis, I think, is, is the way to go right now. And, and we are going to get there, but I think at this point we, we're a little bit premature. So I support the motion, and uh, hopefully we get to May, we'll, uh, we'll be in a better place to start discussing implementation. Thank you. Chair Semino. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I I support the motion to postpone um, going all the way back to Justin's questions about bluefish. And for those of you that were here late last night, you know why I'm taking bluefish seriously. Um, <laughs> um, but my, my, my question is to the ERP working group and then I guess also to staff. Um, we have two extremes and then we have maybe a management scenario that makes most sense in these examples. Uh, are you are you putting that up there for us as the a way forward that you think that you can achieve in the very near future say getting us examples by May are there other things that you think you should be looking at and then my question to staff is if if you feel this is the very next step but during this process between now and May is there a way to communicate back to the board that we now realize there are other than just looking at target and threshold for everything, there are other things we would like to explore. I, I think this certainly this certainly frames the uncertainty and the possibilities, right? Um, other other options, or you can certainly see how you would go in between some of these particular options. You know, you half rebuild, you know, weak fish or or whatever. You could certainly do something as more of an integrated uh, sort of integral approach. Um, as far as whether whether or not, you know, you could run a million scenarios. Um, so I think it's I think it's important to sort of hem them down to the stuff that you think is vitally important. Um, as far as communicating with us um, and the timeline, I'm gonna I'll let staff deal with that particular issue. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So I I think you know we put these examples together as sort of low-hanging fruit um there are a million and one different combinations that the erp work group could provide and then that is a very very daunting task so we put a few that are in line with the example that has already been provided and i do see a bit of feedback going on uh, back and forth potentially with the board and the ERP work group, say we come back in May and realize that um, this is satisfying. We don't really need to explore this this particular subset of runs anymore, or maybe we need to add to this list. I think that that can definitely happen. Fabio, just a, a quick question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just. You know, is this a reasonable amount of work between now and the May meeting? Given the personalities at the front of the table, I assume a couple of hands would have shot up. But, um, <laughs> you know, I just want to make sure that, that, you know, this is something that the group thinks you guys can do. And if there are some additional options, I think, not speaking for the board, but I would assume there's some latitude for the group to explore some hybrids or something in the middle of these options or, or, or you know as you guys work through these if there's something that you feel would be very informative for the board in May I think you guys 
I don't know if anyone would, would object to giving you guys the latitude to, to go ahead and you know explore some middle of the road options and those sorts of things. But mostly, I just want to make sure this is doable by the May meeting. Yes, we selected this sort of very limited. We didn't want to give you guys like complete free reign and say, like, give us all of your ideas. So we picked a select few that we thought would be very informative, stay within the bounds of existing FMPs, which does sort of limit what you can do, but also is doable by the ERP group in time for May. So if you, if you guys want to start adding onto this list, um, I think we would definitely have to sort of pull back a, um, a few things depending on how far down the road you went, but this is doable by the May meeting. Mel Bell. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think there's a new guy I was just struggling with a process uh, question here, and it seemed like perhaps the Menhaden board was making a, a decision or a commitment on the part of other boards. Um, and you mentioned the policy board discussion, and I think that's probably how that gets ironed out. But I, I guess what, what we're basically doing here is we're going to set some level for Menhaden, and then that sort of drives, that, that fixes that in place, and then that kind of drives the potential for the other parts of the train to come in and work. But I, I do think we need to take the first step. It's just how you take that first step. I mean, I agree, you know, you take that first step with the, the long term in mind, but, but that first step is kind of critical, and, and I was kind of getting hung up in process, I think, of how this worked, but I would trust staff and you guys to advise us properly on that just so we're not misstepping but it, it did seem like we were perhaps making a decision and committing committing other other boards to you know play along with it um, so that was it yep I'm gonna throw the ball back in the board's court I mean it is on the board how they want to move forward um, with these different short and long-term goals I keep referring to. The, the way that they identify an ERP and the way they uh, incorporate it into the management program is purely a board decision. What is a pace that you're comfortable with? What kind of level of public input are you comfortable with? Those sorts of things and how, again, the longer term, um, you know, how we integrate other management boards into these decisions is, is another thing we can move forward on at the board's pace. It's really on you guys to decide what's the best way to move forward. We've put together sort of thoughts from staff's perspective on, on how to take small bites at it um, in the short term. John McMurray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I had a question about John Clark's comments. Clearly, I'm misunderstanding something here. I would trump Jim and say I understand maybe 5% of all this. Uh, so, John, you said that we're looking at Menhaden reference points that are approximately 40% lower. Um, I don't understand that because we were just told that at the current F target, we could rebuild Stripe Bass to target. Um, maybe somebody could clarify that for me. It's not at the single species F target, it's at the current F level that Menhaden is experiencing because our quota is set so much lower than you would expect if you were fishing at F target. Follow up. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. I, I understand that now, but the, the point is we don't really have to take any real management action if we adopt this now. Um, and it seems to me like there's no reason to wait until May. And <clears throat> if I'm reading this correctly, there's not even a commitment to act on it in May. We're just looking for more analysis. Um, and I'm looking at this in the context of, of what we've heard from the public. I mean, it took 20 years to get here, and it certainly appears like we're kicking the can down the road. Um, it just seems like this is a real good time to do this, and I'm quite frankly, I'm not really understanding why we're not. As a motion to postpone, the original motion would automatically come back to the board in May, provided these analyses are completed. So it's not kicking it down indefinitely. Um, that motion would, would return. Uh, Richie White. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think the discussion at the policy board, uh, we clearly need that 
uh, to figure out the long term. But the short term, striped bass board and bluefish board already gave direction to the Manhattan board. They're, they're already going down the road of trying to rebuild stocks that's going to need Manhattan. So we're just reacting. I think this will just react to what those boards have already done. So I don't, I don't see it as, gee, we have to go to these other boards to, you know, like get permission or th th this would be our reaction to that. Right. Each of these examples is working within the, the constructs of the existing objectives for those other species. Um, but there could be the larger policy board discussion if we want to deviate from those. Um, Steve Murphy, did you have your hand up earlier? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I, a few years ago, I was watching uh, watching a Senate budget hearing, and somebody stood up and held up a big budget and said, uh, we're going to vote for this, and we'll read it and find out what's in it later. I, I, I just think um, I, I agree with the substitute motion. I think uh, it's important to be deliberative on this. Um, I'm, I'm excited about plowing new ground. I think that's, uh, that's an important step. Uh, I do, my, my take home from this is the conservative management approach that we took on Menhaden w was a good idea and and so, uh, but I, I would like to sort of understand this more fully in depth because I sort of go down the road of now what and I look at species like spot and uh, American eel and I'm like okay now if you want to put that into this same scenario those conservative types of approaches also apply so uh, so I, I support substitute motion to come back and look at this in May I, I really don't see it as kicking the can down the road I just see it as us having more time to deliberate and sort of go back and sort of discuss this with staff and, and uh, stakeholders. Thank you. Spud Woodward. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just, I guess I've got a question um, of this going to be more process related, but in, in the scenarios that are put up here and, and going forward with this, <clears throat> is it going to require that we do synchronized assessments on all these species so that you have the same time series of data analyzed in order to to evaluate, as Jim was saying earlier, performance of this of this approach to, to actually accomplishing its goals. Uh, we would need synchronized assessment schedules of the key predators in the ERP species in order to update the ERP model on the on the same time frame as the Menhaden model. Conceivably, we could, if they're a year or two off, we could have, say, one species ends in 2017 and the rest end in 2018. It's not the end of the world for the, the NWAX mice model. That model really benefits from the long-term projections rather than trying to figure out exactly where you are in 17 versus 18. That's where the BAM model is really shines. And so we would want these species, these predator and prey species to be as up to date as possible when we do the ERP and so thinking about that going forward is also something we would bring up with the policy board. Um, I think it's one of the one of the things to keep in mind is while it's while it would be really great to have these completely in lockstep that's probably not going to really be the case um, but this is this is a broad issue that you could probably bring to the policy board and, and have the policy board sort of um, push that off onto the assessment science committee um, to to think about ways of actually scheduling the assessments um, and the updates so that for the most appropriate use. Yeah, I just wanted to chime in that that's something we'll definitely bring to the attention of the assessment science committee. And I also wanted to note that we did look at the schedule for three years ahead when we were thinking that we might be doing an update and we're not in terrible shape in terms of when the timing of those other assessments are scheduled at the moment. Some of them are tentative, um, but when we, when we looked at it, it wasn't as if we were all off at the moment. So we're in decent shape on that end right now. Mike Millard. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I hope this question makes sense. I can't guarantee it. 
what I'm trying to get at is the added value or the added information that, that this motion is proposing. We've been told um, that striped bass were the most sensitive species to the Manhattan management. So I guess I'm wondering if that works in reverse. This, this motion is suggesting that we go put on pause and then we go to these other species and tweak the dials a little bit and see what that does to the ERP. So in the context of that these other species are less sensitive to menhaden management, does that mean also that tweaking those dials on these species will, will produce less of an influence on the ERP? In other words, is, is what we're asking, which looks like a lot of work to me, I don't know, are we likely to get a great deal of more information or new information out of that with these species? Thank you. Well, I mean, that is that is the question, I think. Um, so yes, striped bass is the most sensitive species, so I don't think we will be seeing a change that's as significant as, say, the difference between the ERP, example ERP, and the single species. However, um, I think the question that uh, Justin brought up earlier is relevant here, which is that if you allow bluefish to rebuild, do you need to leave more menhaden and have a lower menhaden F in order to sustain both striped bass at fishing at its F target and bluefish at its F target. So right now, bluefish is overfished. If we allow that to rebuild, is that going to compete more for menhaden? Is that going to prey more on striped bass and require a lower menhaden F to sustain the population? Or is <coughs> bluefish's sort of lack of sensitivity to menhaden mean that if we sustain striped bass, that excess menhaden is still available to bluefish and they can succeed and remain at a good level even without, even at that same level. And so I think that's kind of what this set of analyses would help provide some information on, which is how sensitive are these reference points to predator, long-term predator F rates, long-term predator conditions. Lynn Fagley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to speak in favor of the substitute motion, and I, and I wanted to just say that do, speaking in favor of this mission is not in the spirit of kicking the can down the road. I think this is um, vitally important that we get to these ERPs, but it is in the spirit in the spirit of transparency. Um, I think that we and um, our public who have been anticipating this will feel better when we bound this problem and we can see um, what the sensitivity of those ERP values actually is. Um, so I, I very much support this effort. And I, I also, I, I just want to say that I think we also need to think in the short term because we're going to face this adopt question in May. Uh, I, I think we're, we are, we're postponing a motion. That's, that's the motion on the table. So when we adopt, what is that? Does that mean that we are then bound by the triggers in Amendment 3, so in other words, does that mean that if we're now fishing according to an ERP and we exceed that and we're overfishing, I think the trigger says we have to reduce F to the target. So I, I'm just trying to understand how the mechanics of the plan would work in terms of holding us accountable to what we adopt. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. I, I think that would be my interpretation. I'm, so we are, um, these ERP reference points are F reference points. So we would be adopting new F targets and thresholds for Menhaden and therefore the triggers associated with the F target and threshold for Menhaden would still be at, in play. Uh, you know, when these ERPs don't create new biomass targets and thresholds for Menhaden. So those triggers might be stagnant. Follow up, follow up, Lynn. So would we, so we, we can monitor, so if we're fishing under an ERP value, that value can be monitored by running the BAM model and looking at the full F. Is that correct? We don't need to run the full the, the mice model to to measure the status of where we are relative to the ERP. So the full F in the BAM 
So let's say, hypothetically, we adopted, where it's two years down the road, we're still in the long term, we're trying to get to that long term goal, and we can see where we are relative to the ERP just by running the BAM and looking at full F. Okay. That's my understanding, but to, there would have, there, at some point there would want to be a reevaluation of the ERP value as the other biomasses in the system have changed. You want to update those data points and run the, the MICE model to see if our ERP targets have changed. But you're, you're right, uh, it's the F estimates are coming for Menhaden are coming from the BAM model. We, we had sort of planned, one of the reasons that we built the MICE model the way we built the MICE model was to allow it to be updated every time you update Atlantic Menhaden, right? So we'll be running, we'll be running the MICE model, um, but also as we go through a benchmark process, we'll look at the full EWE model to make sure that those component parts are, in the MICE model, are still, you know, running along in the same thing. So I think that's, that's been the entire point, but you're exactly correct. Once you base the reference points for the short term, you would be using the, the BAM single species model. Um, yeah, I just want to add to this conversation a little bit, just so we, we understand, so everyone understands. We have uh, the BAM model is producing F estimates for the Menhaden time series, which are then plugged into this EWE mice model, the NWAX mice model, which then produces an F value which goes into the projections model, so which is an extension of the BAM for lack of a better uh, term. So that's sort of the where the F is moving through the systems and resulting in. It's just dependent on the projections model in the end. Um, Eric Reed and then Allison Colden, and then I'd like to um, call the question on the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. So right now we're working with one example, and it has been said that in any example there is a lot of moving parts. And me personally, I'd like to see a few more examples of what that all looks like because I'm not alone in getting my head wrapped around it as well. And, and of course, the, the people who understand 100% of this model have suggested to us that they want to do this and they're telling us to tell them to do it. So I, I don't know why we're having this giant conversation about it, but that, that's what I get out of it. And they were, they were suggesting to us and they were being nice, you know, because we're not listening to them. So, I mean, that, that's, that's my, my second reason. And, and you know, I, I just, okay, I'm good. You said you can do it. I heard you the first time. Let's do it. We're not kicking the can down the road. We're informing ourselves better on what this new puzzle looks like. And I need that. So I support the motion. Thank you. Allison Colden. Uh, I'll be brief. Basically, you know, I'm sympathetic to, to those around the table who want more time and want to see more. And um, I just want to... Um, in the universe of infinite possibilities that could result from this approach moving forward, just want to encourage everyone to think about what comes in May and after May and what it would take. These are the low hanging fruit, right? So what would it take for us to get to the, the hypothetical place of yes for adopting ERPs either between now and May or, you know, whatever happens in May moving forward. So, um, just wanted to, to finish up with that. Dennis, I did see your hand. Um, I would ask if the board is ready to vote. The, I'll go ahead, Dennis. Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I support the motion, but my question is, sitting here thinking in predator-prey relationship, striped bass, menhaden, is any of this gonna be helpful to us in managing the issue of the Chesapeake Bay cap? Yeah, real quickly, no. Um, it, this is, these are, these are coastwide models built on population perspectives. Um, smaller individual areas or time frames such as in seasons 
aren't really possible in this sort of approach simply because you know that that requires just way more data than we really have thank you I, that was the answer i expected is the board ready to vote on the motion okay it has been read into the record without any changes so um is there a need to caucus seeing none all those in favor please raise your right hand Those opposed, please raise your hand. Any null votes or abstentions? Seeing the motion carries unanimously. So we have 15 minutes left um, in our allotted time. Staff did present a couple questions for the long-term goals. We've you know, started to have some of that conversation. We are aware that there's a policy board discussion tomorrow that is going to be um, talking about this. Um, so um, so, so the staff's questions were, do we want to some long-term considerations are to pursue MSC or to initiate dialogue with a policy board. If there's anything particular that this board wants to ask the policy board, we could, we could talk about that now or we could wait to see um, how the policy board's discussion goes tomorrow. It's many of the same people around this table. Um, so I guess I'm looking for, to the board for some, some guidance as to how um, into, the, into the details we want, we want to go on this topic right now. Uh, David Miramont. No more than 15 minutes worth. <laughs> my, sense that I, my sense is that people are um, a bit exhausted right now and that maybe um, we should um, move this discussion to the policy board unless there's any specific uh, input that we have at this point. So that'll, that'll be my approach, um, which brings us to other business. Is there any other business to come before the Menhaden board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Oh, thank you. And um, I will look forward to the May meeting where I'll be sitting over there and Spud Woodward will be up here. <laughs> uh, meeting is adjourned. Before everyone gets up, um, lunch will be served out in the hallway at noon. Um, so we got to you know, kill 15 minutes or so, then lunch will be out there. And uh, oh, is it out there already? Uh, it looks like it's out there already. And then uh, we'll start the South Atlantic board on time.